The Senate Committee on Natural Resources will now come to order. Will the Secretary please call roll? Senator Hansen? Here. Senator Gorgachia? Here. Senator Pazina? Present. Senator Scheibel? Here. Senator Flores? All right, thank you so much. We do have four members present, so we do have a quorum, and please mark Senator Flores present when he arrives. Before we begin today, we'd like to provide some ge general housekeeping reminders for our guests. Please do silence your cell phones and electronic devices. The public is advised that during meetings, legislators and staff are using laptops to view bills and exhibits and not for personal reasons. We're trying to be as paper-free as possible, and please don't look at this as a sign of inattention or disrespect. Please note that we require everyone to submit exhibits in an electronic format the day before the meeting. A few reminders about testifying before the committee. We ask that you do sign in at the table by the door. Do give the committee secretary your business card if you have one prior to testifying. And even if you're not testifying, you may want to sign in so that there's a record of who's interested in a particular bill in case the committee needs to contact you at a later time. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state and spell your name and share your affiliation, if any, for the record. Then turn off the microphone each time you finish speaking. If you have any handouts for the committee, you're asked to provide 10 hard copies to the committee secretary for use by the public. We will be taking public comment at the end of each meeting and we'll be limiting public comment to two minutes. Also for testimony, we are limiting public comment to two minutes so that we have an opportunity for everyone to speak today as we do have three bills that we'll be hearing. Please feel free, however, to provide any additional comments that you do have in writing to the committee secretary and they will be added to the record. I would like to remind everyone today, if you haven't already, do look at Nellis. We do have a number of amendments in for different bills. Um, especially AB 220, I know there's been a lot of questions, so we would ask that everyone has a chance to look at the amendments that are located in Nellis prior to speaking today. And today, again, we're going to be hearing three bills, and we're looking forward to starting out today with Assembly Bill 34, revising provisions relating to water. So we'll go ahead and get started and ask for our state engineer and any other co-presenters to come to the table, and please get started when you're ready. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Adam Sullivan, Nevada State Engineer and Administrator of the Nevada Division of Water Resources, here to present Assembly Bill 34. The purpose of Assembly Bill 34 is to address two distinct issues. The first is challenges that the division is having with newspaper publications and certain uh, notices. And the second is the requirement that, that water right maps be submitted on specific materials. <clears throat> Under existing law, the division is required to publish certain notices in a newspaper of general circulation for a set interval and duration. N newspapers then are required to submit proof of publication within 30 days after the last date of publication. And then once that is received, by the division, then we can proceed with the administrative process. The division has experienced with, with increased frequency some newspapers not publishing exactly what is required or, um, or not providing proof of publication in a timely manner, which impedes the division's ability to move forward with its administrative process and impacts the public who are waiting for the division to act. Additionally, Existing law requires certain maps submitted to the state engineer to be on specific materials, mylar maps to support claims of vested right, and tracing linen to support proof of beneficial use. This does not reflect current practices or the objectives of NDWR to modernize the division's document management to improve efficiencies. So AB 34 in its first reprint didn't, didn't fully alleviate the issues that the division faces with regard to publication of notices. So we're proposing a conceptual amendment that substantially pairs down the bill. It addresses um, concerns that were, that were raised with regard to any potential reduction in public noticing, um, but still advances some of the overall objective to add efficiencies and um, really continue uh, the effective public noticing. So the conceptual amendment removes sections one, two, five, and eight 
of the bill. These are all sections of statute where various notices have to be published in a newspaper, but the state engineer is not required to receive proof of publication. So there's no changes to those sections of law. In effect, this really just leaves section six, which regards, which is in regard to publications of applications to appropriate water, which is the most common publication. We're doing that daily. Um, for those, for those notices, um, they are required to be published once a week for four weeks. Um, and here in this conceptual amendment, uh, so they'd be required to publish once a week for four weeks, but are no longer required to be consecutive. Uh, it, and it also adds the requirement that the division will post the notice of the application on its website. So with regard to other changes in the conceptual amendment, section four makes clarifying changes regarding mailings to potential claimants of stream adjudications. Section nine remains the same as it is a conforming change regarding posting notice of applications on the division's website. And then sections three, 10, and 11 remove mylar and tracing linen requirements, and those remain the same. So with the conceptual amendment, the bill essentially requires newspapers to, to publish a notice of application for four weeks, which is, is the current practice, but it doesn't need to be in consecutive weeks. Um, and upon receipt of that proof of publication, the division can proceed with its process. Um, whereas currently, if, if they're not published in consecutive weeks, we need to resubmit for, for another four consecutive weeks. Um, so while this, does, this change does not eliminate the issues in, entirely that we're experiencing with newspapers, it will re help reduce some of the time delays that the division is experiencing to better serve the public. And the bill also supports the direction of the division to post, to, to post applications conspicuously on its website, which really is the primary way that most people can view and keep track of applications before our office. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the committee? Okay, I do have one question. I've looked at your website, and it can be a little hard to find things. So one thing I would recommend um, for the Division of Water Resources is maybe just trying to post those notices in, again, the most conspicuous place possible, because I consider myself savvy and I've had challenges navigating. So that would be one suggestion from me. Um, more of a comment. Do we have any other questions from the committee? All right, we'll have you step back. Thank you very much to our state engineer and those who'd like to testify in support, please come forward. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Kyle Rohrink with the Great Basin Water Network. We just, uh, we support the bill. We want to thank the division uh, for their work. They've completely uh, nixed concerns that we had about due process issues, and it's been a really great uh, collaborative experience, and um, that's all we have to say. Thank you. Easy enough. Look at that. Well under two minutes. Thank you so much. Do we have any other comments and support on Assembly Bill 34? Okay. Anyone in Las Vegas? BPS, anyone on the phones in support of AB 34? If you would like to testify in support of AB 34, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, this is Patrick Donnelly, P-A-T-R-I-C-K-D-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y. I'm Great Basin Director with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we're in support of the uh, conceptual amendment for this bill. Uh, we had concerns when this bill was uh, heard on the other side, and those concerns have largely been addressed. Uh, so we are in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donnelly. BPS, anyone else on the phones in support? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. 
All right, we'll close testimony on support of AB 34 and open testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 34. Um, anyone in Carson City? Seeing no one coming to the front here, or it doesn't look like in Vegas either for Assembly Bill 34. Do we have anyone on the phones, BPS? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 34, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you so much. We'll close out testimony on opposition of AB 34 and open any testimony in neutral. Welcome to the front. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. For the record, my name is Steve Walker, representing Eureka County. On the assembly side, we oppose this bill. Uh, we worked uh, work, working with the state engineer and other stakeholders. Where well, the amendment came through, we moved this to neutral. Thank you. All right, thank you. I don't see anyone else coming to the front in neutral here or in Las Vegas. I wonder what bill all of our Las Vegas friends could be here for. Uh, BPS, do we have anyone on the phones in neutral on AB 34? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 34, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right, Mr. Sullivan, would you like to come up and make any closing comments? Well, look at how easy that was. With that, we're going to close the hearing on Assembly Bill 34 and open the hearing on Assembly Bill 86, revising provisions relating to animal welfare. And with that, we'll invite the Assemblywoman to the front and please get started when you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Pazina and members of the Senate Natural Resource Committee. I'm Assemblywoman Melissa Hardy. I represent Assembly District 22, and I am here today to present Assembly Bill 86, which revises provisions relating to animal welfare. And I also have with me um, Cadence Matijevic from Washoe County. Um, she will help me go over some of the work that we've been doing on this bill. So just to start, I want to make sure we've had um, <laughs> A little bit of confusion between um, my office and the committee office here about the mock-up and so I, I want to make sure that you all have a, a copy of that we did make a copy of that for you and there's a couple over there um, just in case it didn't get on Nellis um, just want to make sure before we start that we all have that no it's a Thank you so much, Ms. Kennedy, and thank you so much, Assemblywoman. Okay. All right. Um, so as a, a legislator and animal lover, I am passionate about finding ways to ensure that animals are safe and protected and to strengthen our animal cruelty laws. Animals cannot advocate for themselves or protect themselves when they are harmed, and it is up to us to be their voice. I believe that we have a moral imperative as legislators that when we see our animal cruelty laws can be strengthened, we take the opportunity to do so. And that is exactly what my bill seeks to do. So now I'm gonna have um, Cadence go through the mock-up. We did have one thing that we wanted to amend since the first reprint from the assembly hearing. So I'll have her go through that and right now if that's okay. Good afternoon, Chair Pazina, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Cadence Matijevic, C-A-D-E-N-C-E-M-A-T-I-J-E-V-I-C-H, and I have the privilege of representing Washoe County. Um, Chair Pazina, with your permission, I think it would maybe best for me just to walk through the bill, and then when we get to the section with the amendment, I can address it, unless you think that the digest handles it, and I, you want me to just go directly to the amendment, whatever your preference is, Madam Chair. 
Please go ahead and walk through the bill. Thank you. I'd be glad to. Thank you. Again, Cadence Mitievich for the record. Um, and I will say that Washoe County is here. We worked with Assemblywoman Hardy on some amendments um, in the assembly side that, were, um, that I'll talk specifically about as we go through it. So, uh, and the majority of the bill is in section one, so I'm really just gonna talk about the bill. There's a 1.5 that I'll get to. Um, but section one expands applicability of the provisions of NRS 574.100 that an animal uh, kept for working purposes uh, and uh, a, to a domesticated animal that is not owned by any person. And we felt that that was appropriate to have the bills, this, the provisions of, of the existing statute um, also apply to those types of animals. Um, there are some exceptions that I'll get to in, later in my presentation um, where certain animals are exempt from certain provisions of the statutes, um, and I'll go through those specifically as we continue on. Um, section one expands the definition of an animal abandonment and establishes such action as a crime regardless of whether the animal is injured, infirm, or healthy. Section 1.5 re repeals the existing language pertaining to abandonment that's currently contained in NRS 574.110 and replaces the repealed provisions with the new language in NRS 574.100. The proposed amendment that you see in the mock-up on bill page three, beginning at line 13, seeks to clar further clarify the definition of abandonment to specify that a person who delivers an animal to a representative of an animal rescue organization or animal shelter is not considered to have abandoned the animal. We think this clarification is necessary so that it's clear that somebody who simply drops off an animal, uh, one or more animals, at the doorstep of a rec rescue organization or an animal shelter without facilitating the safe delivery of that animal to, a rep to another person would be considered to have abandoned the, the animal. Unfortunately, we, we do see this happen, um, and, and those animals are, are unsafe in the time that they're just left unattended at the doorstep or tied up to a pole outside of these organizations. Uh, so we wanna make it clear that they actually have to deliver the animal to a person. Uh, the bill includes specific criteria for charging as a criminal act, animal cruelty and circumstances commonly seen by animal services agencies that are not included within existing statute to include failure to provide necessary veterinary care to a sick or injured animal, failure to provide proper ventilation for animals kept in an enclosed space, including sheds, barns, and garages. I do wanna clarify, that doesn't mean an outdoor enclosure, like a fenced enclosure that's open air. These are talking about confined enclosures. Um, and then also certain grooming standards to prevent animal suffering. The bill clarifies that collars, harnesses, and other devices must be properly fitted, and there's a definition on page seven of the bill and prohibits using a tether, chain, tie, trolley, or pulley system to restrain a dog if a weight is attached to that type of restraint. Further, the bill establishes that if a dog is left unattended outdoors for more than 14 hours in a 24-hour period without immediate access to the indoors, they must be provided with the following. Adequate shelter, which is defined beginning on, on line 42 of page three of the bill through line 10 of page four an area that allows the dog to avoid standing water and exposure to excessive animal waste, shade from direct sunlight, and potable water. The bill adds to those dogs which are exempt from subsections two and three of section one of the bill, these are these ex exemptions I mentioned earlier, to include dogs actively in engaged in, in or training for police, military, patrol, or detection work, search and rescue, Herding, livestock guarding, or otherwise working, a role as a guide dog, hearing dog, or service dog, or trials, sporting, or other lawful competitions or competitive functions. And finally, the language on page five of the bill, beginning at line seven, would exempt indigent persons from being subjects to paragraph E and F of the subsection one of the bill. Those are the requirements for the veterinary care and grooming. 
And with that, I will turn it back over to Assemblywoman Hardy to discuss why that particular language around the exemption for indigent persons uh, was added when, when the bill was considered in the Assembly um, and some recent um, dialogue that we've had with some folks with concerns about that. I would also add, if I may, Madam Chair, um, I do have uh, in the audience Cheyenne Schull, who's the director of the Washoe County Regional Animal Services Department, here available to answer any questions that the committee might have on a technical nature about animal uh, services agency. So if you need that, we're, we're glad to bring her to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Melissa Hardy for the record. So as um, Ms. Mativich mentioned, in the assembly hearing, um, there were questions you know, regarding persons that are unhoused you know, and how we would handle that, you know, not taking their little companion away from them. And so, um, and also then that was kind of expanded to uh, individuals that would be in a situation where they didn't have means to provide, provide care. So we had discussions of how we address those concerns and that is where the exemption language um, came from that you see in the current reprint. Um, in the last two days, we have had um, concerns brought forward about that the exemption's too broad and then we're putting um, the animal control officers in a, a position where they go out and they see something that's egregious and um, they wouldn't be able to take any action because of those exemptions. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, and I, you know, I've always, in my time here in the legislature, always been open to discussions and hearing from everyone. And so I still am, you know, if we can get to an agreement that everyone could support that. Um, also, recognizing that we, we are on a limited time and so um, I just wanted to give you an update of, of where that section came from, where the discussions we've had and kind of where, where it's at right now. So with that, we'd be happy to take your questions. Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I guess I'm just kind of, because of my rural background, I'm kind of concerned about domesticated animal, whether owned by a person or not. That gets pretty broad. Uh, you know, we're not talking about dogs and cats again. That gets clear into, uh, the way I understand it, a domesticated animal. We're talking about horses, billy goats, uh, you name it. And uh, then as we move into the bill, then if you don't feel they're adequately caring for those animals, they, or let's say livestock, uh, they are a domesticated animal. So I'm just kind of concerned about that. Your health, uh, <laughs> your animal control officers are going to have a lot of work if they start touring and looking up every cow or horse that's a little short in this country. Uh, for the record, Caden Smitievich, through you, uh, Madam Chair, to please Senator, go direct to Senator Grokachia. Thank you. Um, uh, my reading is that 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 piece there. Um, talks about um, the the torture, unjustifyingly injuring, maiming, killing. Uh, you, you know that that a domestic right that you wouldn't unjustify uh, unjustifiably that you wouldn't torture, unjustifiably injure, maim, mutilate, or kill a domestic animal that is not owned by any person. And you're right that would include uh, horses and goats, um, uh, you know, or other animals. I, I think we've seen instances where. Um, there are domesticated animals um, that are not that are strays, um, and we and we see that unfortunately people it's not owned by anybody, so it doesn't it, you know it, that it's not the same um, a, as an animal that's owned by someone, and and we felt that that was wrong. Um, I, I don't. Uh, your, your question I'm going to need to think about a little bit more and read through the bill again to see whether or not all of the provisions in here apply to a domesticated animal. I don't know that that was the intent, and so if we need to clarify that, I think we can. Okay, I'd, I'd appreciate that because when we come then to line 14 and deprive an animal or cause an animal to be deprived, again, when you run the whole gamut of domesticated animals, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in your mind or your officer's mind, he might think, well, that horse shouldn't have another 10 pounds of hay, and sure. hay is $400 a ton, so the owner, he says, no, I think yeah. 10's, he's getting by on 10. Uh, you know, it, it becomes... Understood for the record, Caden Smitievich. Madam Chair, if I may, I might do the, the phone a friend thing and turn around and look at Ms. Schull and see if she's at, she has anything to add at this point. She may not, and we may need to get back to you.
Good afternoon. For the record, Cheyenne Schull, Director of Washoe County Regional Animal Services. Um, as NRS is currently enforced, they do pertain to um, domestic animals such as goats and horses and livestock, and our officers do enforce the cruelty section that we are talking about today. If I may, Madam Chair, uh, then, then I guess it becomes, you know, it's up to the officer then at that point to determine and, and, and you know, I guess I know where you're coming from, but what might what your you or your officers might consider inhumane, uh, and, and I assume there's going to be a penalty associated with this, so uh, I could see where it gets could get problematic. Uh, you know, again, companion animals, but when we get into the broad base of domesticated, that gets awful broad in my mind. And uh, I think you're going to have a lot of work, or a lot of work for your people. Uh, it, it's, it becomes then, you just, in your mind, yeah, he is being neglected, and yet maybe the person that owns that particular animal uh, thinks they're doing what's appropriate or, or getting by, and, and it becomes very speculative. So I, I don't know how. Then I assume you issue them a ticket and you go to court. And don't get me wrong, there are people out there I would love to have you come and ticket. <laughs> Cheyenne Till, for the record again. Uh, typically, when we get calls for the type of cruelty or neglect, uh, this t the nature of this type of call, we're generally seeing some type of, uh, some type of, you know, the, the animal's underweight, there is hooves that are overgrown, there are definitely um, neglect issues that are obvious, and so my officers will respond and generally make contact with the owner to determine what is and is not being done to take care of the animals. And we generally start with warnings if it's not particularly egregious to try to work to remedy the situation with the uh, animal owner. So I, I understand it varies uh, depending on the animal control agency, uh, but it definitely is one of the things that we try to work to a um, remedy with the animal owner. I thank you for that, and, and it, just as I look at the bill, I see some, you know, you haven't shared that sheep for three years. He, he's doing fine, but he's he's got 40 pounds of wool on him. Again, under this, that is a citable defense. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I, uh, Senator Grekichi, I think maybe I can address some of your concerns about- Ms. Smitievich, please give your name for I'm the record. I'm so sorry, Caden no Smitievich for the record. Um, Senator Grekichi, I think maybe some of your concerns about that, that it's a domesticated animal that's not owned by a person. Um, so we're talking about an animal that's a stray that then another person that likely doesn't have any connection to that animal would be torturing or injuring, maiming, mutilating, or killing. Um, and, and I think right now there are concerns that with the existing statue, the way that it's written, that if, it, that if it's a stray, that the animal control officers may find someone who doesn't own that animal and may not be able to take action against them um, because the animal isn't owned by someone. And I think that's what we were attempting to get out here. Certainly, if the animal is owned by someone and is not providing them, that the example of a sheep that you gave is a good one, um, I think that's a little bit different than what we were trying to get to here with the language about not owned by a person, um, and I certainly don't want to speak for Assemblywoman Hardy, but I think we're open to, to if we need to clean that language up to make that more clear, to uh, address your concerns and tar ta more narrowly tailor it, we're certainly open to that. No, I'm fine as long as we've got that on the record. And again, you're talking about a domestic animal that is not owned by anyone domestic. And they should have been at a horse hearing this morning, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> No horsing around there. You're exactly right, Senator. Um, Vice Chair. Thank you, and um, thank you for the presentation. As we're sitting here, you know, I'm looking at the language that you discussed on, I think it's page five, um, and trying to, five. subsection five, and trying to think through um, some other possible ways to get at the same issue, because I completely agree that we shouldn't be criminalizing poverty. Um, and there's absolutely a difference between not taking your animal to the vet because you can't and not taking your animal to the vet because you won't. Um, and so I'm just going to throw out a th few suggestions on the record, if that's okay with you. Okay, <laughs> you could look on, in section one on um, subsections E and F, you could um, add a term like knowingly or willfully, so to willfully deprive 
an ill, infirm, or injured animal of necessary veterinary care willfully has previously been defined um, in statute and also in case law, and it is used in the criminal context. I'll give you a citation. Um, State v. Second Judicial District Court, um, that's 136 Nevada, 191. Um, you could look at that case for what willful has been defined as in the past. Another thing that you could do in um, Section 5 is create a rebuttable presumption that somebody who is indigent um, is not in violation of subsections E and F. So it would be, you would still run into the problem of um, the, the shifting burden and whether or not they would be arrested first and then charged or whether they would have to be, or whether an officer would have to overcome the presumption before they even charge them. But it's just another way to kind of revert to to add another safeguard in there, or you could do it in reverse. You could say that somebody, there's a rebuttable presumption that somebody has intentionally deprived an animal of um, care, but give them an affirmative defense to that. I That would not be my preferred solution because then you're talking about bringing people into court and putting the burden on them to prove that they are indigent and couldn't afford veterinary care. However, it's still better than, in my opinion, leaving the statute open, you could provide that affirmative defense that if you are charged with subsections E and F, you can show that you didn't have the financial means, that you would have taken your animal if you could have, that you, you know, made some other efforts to provide care for that animal and didn't. Um, and I would also suggest that it, it might ameliorate some concerns if you found somewhere in the statute to, um, provide notice to people of places where they can receive low cost veterinary care. So we kind of share the burden of ensuring that animals that belong to people who are unhoused or indigent are cared for. Um, and that one's, a, I know it's a little bit more nebulous, but um, you know, you, you know your community is best if there is a way that you can include, uh, maybe it's uh, when they receive that public assistance, they also receive um, a, a note card that says, by the way, free spay and neuter clinics at the animal shelter every second Tuesday of the month. I don't know what it is, but if you put that in statute, then maybe that would counterbalance the presumption that some, so if you put both things in statute, right, you say that, you know, you have to take your animal to the vet if you can, and we're going to provide you with information for how to do it, then I think that also provides another way that it becomes more reasonable to hold people accountable if they don't take their animal to the vet if they were also informed of how and where they could have. So those are just some ideas. <laughs> Melissa Hardy, for the record, thank you, Senator Scheibel, for the suggestions. I really appreciate that. Um, that's exactly, you know, what we've been talking about and some things that we could add, you know, or, or to this. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, we were trying to write them down with, without a pen. So <laughs> We can certainly follow up offline, too. I just, like you said, time is of the essence. So I thought I'd put them on the record instead of um, trying to schedule a meeting for the next three days and doing it on Friday morning. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman, for being open to working with stakeholders. And that was a part I had had a concern with earlier. So I really appreci appreciate the vice chair for sharing some suggestions there. And let's definitely circle back. Since our intention in this committee is to handle any work sessions by Thursday, so let's um, connect sooner than later on any amendments. And we appreciate your work on that. And I believe Senator Hansen had a question as well. Actually, most of mine were addressed by the other two. I, bottom line with this bill, as I read it, is it, it's designed for people that are middle class and upper in income and the ability to deal with animals. You know, vet, necessary veterinary care. You have to groom the animal. Um, you have to, the, the particular interest to me was the adequate shelter part, which includes a sturdy structure that is waterproof, ventilated, constructed of sound and substantial material, um, provides a solid surface, resting platform, pad, floor, or similar to that. I mean, I've seen more dogs, because as a plumber, I spent lots of time in poor people's houses, frankly, and I've seen lots of dog houses that were made out of plywood in the backyard, and, and frankly, less than desirable conditions, but I don't think those people should be criminalized because they frankly don't have the finances to do the stuff that this bill basically requires. This people that live in uh, you know, my world for the most part can afford to build really fancy dog houses and take their animals to the vet when they're sick and get them groomed. 
Um, there's a huge section of our population that can't, and I, and I think that was the concern that uh, Senator Scheibel uh, w was addressing. But I don't know, the, the, you know, the, uh, this bill, the way I read it, it's, it's focusing on the wrong people and that the people who can already afford to do all these things will, and the people that can't afford it are going to be the ones that are going to get penalized. They're the ones that I think are most vulnerable to this. And I was intrigued by the fact that in the assembly, the, um, uh, the public defenders of all people came in opposition to the bill. So I don't know, I, as I look at it, I think the questions were addressed. If there's some way to do this, um, the, the other problem I've got with the concept of, well, if they're poor, they shouldn't be held accountable. If our concern in the bill is to prevent animal cruelty, if it's cruel for a wealthier person to do it, it can't be right for a poorer person to do it. So I, I, there's a, a moral dilemma here a little bit to me. And last thought, I, and I'll try to make a question. I see the chair looking at me. The feral cat issue is quite interesting in this. Um, I, it, my office is right along the Truckee River, and we've had a huge problem with people letting cats go down there. They literally eliminate all of the native wildlife, quail, birds, cottontail rabbits, literally were gone. So I'm wondering, since you deal with that, are you the one that goes and collects those animals? Somebody went and did a complete removal along the river one time. I don't know if that's something your agency does or, or who did that, but as I read this, if I go down there and I literally have animals that are in need of being put down, if you will, will I be a criminal now if I go and kill a feral cat along the Truckee River? Cheyenne Schill, for the record. Um, if you're re referencing Washoe County, um, the Nevada Humane Society has a partnership with Washoe County to sponsor a TNR program, a trap, neuter, and release program. Mm -hmm. And they are responsible for managing those populations within our county. And so if there are nuisance complaints, those get forwarded to the Nevada Humane Society primarily and first, and if they're unresolvable, then they will come to animal services and we'll do what we can to mitigate those. But feral cats are considered um, uh, undomesticated. They're not uh, tame animals. They're wild uh, cats that are um, considered non, uh, you can't contain them, you can't keep them in a property. They're not something you're gonna bring in your home. And they are considered, as long as they're spayed and neutered and part of a colony, they are allowed to be uh, free roaming. And so it is not legal to trap and euthanize, shoot, dispose of, however, um, a cat just because it's a nuisance to someone. So I hope that answers the question. It depends on the county and the city jurisdictions, but in Washoe County, we do have a feral cat ordinance. Okay. Well, yeah, it does sort of, uh, because it concerns me that those animals are actually displacing the native populations of wildlife. And you basically just said, can't do anything about it, short of spaying and neutering them and hoping that they don't reproduce. Um, I guess the bigger question is, what about the moral dilemma? I don't understand why poor people can basically, I don't know, cause animal suffering because they're poor, but wealthier people could be held accountable under this bill. For the record, Caden Smitievich. Uh, Senator Hansen, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, when, when the original bill language was brought forward, that wasn't in there. Um, we heard concerns from stakeholders and from committee members on the assembly side, and in the spirit of compromise, we tried to arrive at, something, at language that would pro prohibit someone from being charged with a crime uh, because they couldn't av av avoid the circumstances that would result in them being charged with that crime simply because of their financial resources. And, and we know that in our, in our unhoused population, sometimes that animal companionship is critical to their well-being and their quality of life. And so we struggled with it, and that's how we came to this language. Um, based on the feedback that we've heard in the last couple of days, we didn't stick the landing on that, so we need to keep working on it um, with some great suggestions by your, <laughs> your fellow senator there. Um, I, I think, you know, your, your statement that it appears that the bill is intended for middle class and upper middle class, that isn't the case. Um, and much of the bill applies to any person, irrespective of their financial means. 
It's specifically the pieces around the veterinary care and the grooming, because those are generally things that you have to have financial resources in order to be able to provide. Um, I, I think the point about there being resources available, um, that varies also county by county. Um, in Washoe County, we do have those, and, and we try wherever we can um, to make people aware of them that would likely mitigate the number of circumstances where somebody uh, would find themselves there. Um, and, and I have confidence in our animal services officers that they would make those folks aware of it. But I, I don't think there's any harm in putting a requirement for that in the statute um, that may help to address those. Okay, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, last thought, though, real quick, and that is uh, the homeless population along the Truckee River. I'm very familiar with that area as well with those folks, and they consistently have animals um, roaming. In fact, it's a problem. If people uh, have stopped using the bike trails and stuff in some areas because they're literally having dogs chase them and everything else, not to mention the fecal matter and other things that have kind of ruined some of that. But they're some of the worst abusers of, of this law, and their animals threaten other people, yet they could, under this law, the way the, the um, exemptions are, you actually end up, uh, you, you couldn't basically prosecute or take the dogs away from them, if I'm reading this correctly, because they are considered indigent or too poor or whatever the, the, the uh, verbiage is in this, in this new law. Um, how do you deal with that situation? Caden Smichievich, for the record. Um, Senator Hansen, I actually don't think that the bill does that. Uh, I think that the exemption is very narrowly tailored to the requirement in this statute regarding veterinary care and grooming. The ordinances and statutes that pertain to animals at large and a requirement to pick up animal waste are not impact. We, we don't believe that this language exempts anyone from those requirements. And so where, um, where, we, where we do observe and witness those, our enforcement officers um, you know, animal services officers and, and law enforcement officers could continue to take action um, where they see that. We don't believe that this bill changes that at all. Okay, well, thank you. We'll ca carry that on out uh, offline because there, there are some cases where that is not being enforced, in my opinion, at all uh, in, in areas of Washington County. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, and, and I would remind you as well, I, I do think, at least for this particular bill, it was very narrowly tailored. Um, the, the provisions in Section 5 of paragraphs E and F of subjects of subsection 1 do not apply to an indigent person. Um, so I, I think at least for this bill, they did try to tailor that. Um, and we can always take any other questions at a later time. Um, did you have anything else? Okay. Back to the vice chair. Thank you. I did just want to follow up because I, I do share my colleagues' concerns about treating people differently based on their financial means. Um, and in this case, I also think that there is a good public policy reason for exempting people from certain requirements when they are indigent because as a public policy matter, if we take the stance that anybody who fails to provide veterinary care to an animal is equally culpable, then and our public policy, the purpose is to prevent suffering of animals, I don't think we accomplish that goal. Because then you're taking animals from somebody, or you're taking an animal away from the person who they know and trust and love, who may be unhoused, in order to do what? Take them to a local shelter where they will similarly struggle, I don't want to say struggle to receive care, but where, you know, then the state is on the hook for providing that care. And I don't think we end up if the state can even afford it, you know, because sometimes we're talking about basic veterinary care. Sometimes we're talking about extremely expensive surgeries. And so we're actually talking about a lot of animals that would just get euthanized if they were taken to a shelter. So um, I do see the public policy purpose in saying that this is aimed at preventing suffering of animals where it can be prevented and where it can't, we, we take that situation into account. Hey, thank um, you so if, much if for I the thoughtful questions. Just, um, yes, quickly, we'll have you okay, respond. Yeah, I just, Melissa Hardy, for the record, I, and I, I think, um, Vice Chair, you hit the nail on the head of what we were trying to accomplish in this bill, exactly that, where it's, you know, very egregious, you know, that they haven't had the care, the grooming, and then, you know, not, not taking away a person's pal, you know, and so we've tried to walk that line, and again, I appreciate the suggestions and, and how we get to that is is what we're trying to accomplish here so thank you all right we thank you so much um, we thank 
you especially for working with our committee members as we know we're on a tight timeline now with deadlines this week which is also why we're limiting our comments to two minutes per person in support opposition and neutral today because we do want to hear from anyone and there's a lot of people that I'm sure um, have a lot to share so with that said we will open up testimony in support of assembly bill 86 please come on forward to the tables and if there's anyone in Las Vegas, please head to the tables for Assembly Bill 86 and support. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, Chair Pazina and the committee. My name is Rebecca Goff, and I'm the Nevada State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. We support the original intent of this bill, which is defining adequate shelter and abandonment. We have spoken to the sponsor, and while we are, of course, supportive of the idea of adding grooming and veterinary care clauses into the statute, we do feel that there needs to be some work on the exemptions. We're very happy to hear some of the suggestions that Senator Scheibel brought forward, and we are confident that the sponsor and us can come to an agreement to move forward to protect pets and, anim and people in this state. We understand the delicacy of the situation, and we want to make sure that no people are inadvertently harmed in our quest to protect innocent animals. We're committed to working with the sponsor and fellow stakeholders to make sure this bill is right for pets and people here in Nevada. Thank you. All right. PPS, do we have anyone on the phones who is in support of AB 86? Thank you. If you would like to testify in support of AB 86, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right. Thank you so much. With that, we will close testimony in support of AB 86 as I stare at the adorable dog who's near the front row, and I think all of us are ready to run off the dais to go pet. Um, is there anyone here in opposition of AB 86? If so, please come to the table in the front or in Las Vegas as well. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. John Pure from the Clark County Public Defender's Office, also testifying on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. Uh, I'd like to thank Assemblywoman Hardy for bringing this bill forward and also continuing to work with us to kind of strike the right balance. It's, it's difficult when you're trying to craft policy that both uh, helps the animals that you're trying to help but doesn't harm the humans that are their companions as well. And so we're still working on that, uh, the veterinary care, the grooming. We're not trying to give anybody license to not take care of their pets, Senator Hansen. But what we are trying to do is make sure that if you are poor but you still love your animal it's not going to be taken away from you uh, so we're going to work on striking that balance thank you thank you so much not seeing anyone else here in carson city or las vegas bps do we have anyone on the phones in opposition of ab 86 if you would like to testify in opposition to ab 86 please press star nine now to take your place in the queue There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right, we'll close down any testimony in opposition of AB 86 and open testimony in neutral. Anyone here in Carson City or in the South in Las Vegas? BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 86, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm actually speaking in support. I had some technical difficulties. I apologize. Uh, my name is Bob Brilling Smith. That's B O B R I L L I N G hyphen S M I T H. And I represent the American Kennel Club. The American Kennel Club strongly supports a humane treatment of dogs and believes that no dog or animal should be kept in cruel circumstances. We agree that those convicted of animal cruelty should be held accountable as Assembly Bill 86 ensures. Well-written animal cruelty laws, such as Assembly Bill 86, ensure the protection for both animals and responsible animal owners. That is the intent of the bill and why we support Assembly Bill 86. We appreciate the thoughtfulness of the language of the bill and that it does not specify or treat all dogs as the same or needing the same environments to be healthy. For example, a Chihuahua and a Siberian Husky differ greatly. This bill acknowledges that by not specifying certain absolute conditions for all dogs, like specific temperatures or size and space requirements. All too often, one-size-fits-all legislative fixes that are pursued to protect animals 
end up leaving some animals to fall through the cracks. Assembly Bill 86 started off as a good bill, but through, and I really want to thank her, the extensive outreach by Assemblywoman Hardy and her office to consult with a tru truly diverse group of stakeholders, including us at the American Kennel Club. This is now a bill that passed unanimously through the Assembly and should serve as a model to be adopted by other jurisdictions across the country. The American Kennel Club eagerly looks forward to Assembly Bill 86's passage and respectfully asks for the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you very much. BPS, do we have anyone else? And we will, of course, put that testimony in support in our notes. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. All right, we'll close down testimony in neutral slash support and invite Assemblywoman Hardy if she has any final comments. Thank you, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. I appreciate you hearing this bill and all the suggestions that have been brought forward. And I look forward to um, working on this to where we can get it uh, to a place that is supportive and that we can protect our pets and also, you know, um, allow those owners to, to keep, you know, their, their precious companions and little members of their family. And so, again, I appreciate you hearing the bill, and we will get back to you with uh, what we come up with. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much again, Assemblywoman, and I encourage those conversations to happen um, in the next day or so. Um, and really appreciate all the work you've put into this bill. And again, it's hard not to run down there and pet our furry friend in the front row. So thank you so much. And with that, we will close down the hearing on AB 86 and appreciate all the comments by everyone. And we will open the hearing on, I feel like where many people in the room have come in Las Vegas and here in Carson City for Assembly Bill 220, revising provisions relating to water conservation. We welcome Assemblyman Watts and any co-presenter he might have and please go ahead and get started when you're ready thank you thank you very much madam chair members of the committee for the record howard watts representing assembly district 15 in clark county i'm glad to present assembly bill 220 uh, for your consideration today I'm joined by Andy Belanger and Colby Pellegrino with the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Uh, and I believe we'll also have, uh, we may have Senator Wynn joining us uh, if she's if not otherwise engaged to uh, discuss the uh, amendment that we're going to be proposing to this bill. Uh, I'm going to really speak at a high level about uh, the, the goals uh, that and, and the reasoning behind bringing this bill forward and, and uh, cover kind of the key points um, that this bill seeks to address and then turn it over to uh, the Water Authority to speak a little bit more to the, the specifics of the measure. Uh, during the, uh, the interim, I, as you all know, chaired the interim, the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Natural Resources. Uh, and we had uh, many conversations about water, both in the, the standing committee as well as the subcommittee on public lands, including a, a full day meeting in Boulder City where uh, water conservation was a primary focus. And uh, this was uh, one of the recommendations that came out of uh, the, the interim standing committee was to address water conservation specifically in southern Nevada. Uh, I think most folks are aware of the issues that we have seen uh, with Lake Mead and along the Colorado River, a river shared by seven different states, one that has been uh, recently in, uh, up until recently in quite a precipitous decline. And while we have had a great winter and uh, there's a lot to be happy about in terms of lake levels rising for once instead of dropping uh, continuously, uh, we still have uh, some very significant issues we need to face. Um, I believe you uh, earlier heard uh, uh, resolution about the importance of collective action to help preserve the Colorado River. Overall, while we may have some great above average years, um, overall we've seen the average flow of the Colorado River decline, and we also have uh, even outside of that, a structural deficit in terms of usage among the, the states along the river exceeding uh, even the long-term historical average flows. Uh, that leaves Nevada with the smallest uh, share of Colorado River water of any state, 
but that making up 90% of the water supply for the Southern Nevada community, um, uh, it puts us in, in quite a tricky position. Uh, additionally, our, our community has, after you know, a period of exploring uh, other options to bring in water, has really dedicated itself to making sure that we can continue to support the, our community for the foreseeable future on our existing local water resources, which is, again, a, a bit of groundwater in the Las Vegas Valley area and primarily Colorado River water. In order to do that, we really have to lead uh, in conservation and lead uh, not just uh, in the state, but really across the region. It's critical that we do that so that as uh, federal shortages have already been declared and reduced uh, the amount of uh, water that we can draw out of the Colorado River, uh, that we can be able to continue to sustain our communities, but also, again, to address some of those uh, bigger, broader issues that we're facing, uh, we need to lead. We need to lead in showing other urban areas across the, the arid west what can be done. We need to lead uh, by example as well uh, and, and put forward a commitment from the uh, urban municipal use sector uh, to encourage all other sectors to conserve water. If we are all able to uh, do not more with less, but even do the same with less water, uh, that is ultimately the solution that's going to allow our, com our communities to sustain themselves moving forward. Uh, obviously, uh, during the last legislative session, we passed landmark legislation uh, calling for the uh, removal of non-functional grass turf in southern Nevada over the next several years. Um, legislation that will reduce the water consumption in the Las Vegas Valley where due to our proximity to Lake Mead, uh, the more we can reduce the water that's kind of being consumed in the system and the more that we can focus on uh, recycling uh, water within that system, well, we can really uh, help sustain uh, our resources. And there's been, uh, in addition to that, actions taken at the local level related to pool size, related to golf courses, uh, all aimed at getting our consumptive use of water down. Uh, and AB 220 really seeks to build on that. Uh, you know, it has a few key provisions. Uh, one is relating to uh, septic systems. There's been robust discussion on this. I'm sure many of you have heard about this issue. There will be an amendment uh, proposed to make additional changes to the bill as it stands in its first reprint. Uh, but ultimately, what the issue comes down to is this at a very high level. Septic systems in our community, uh, you know, they, those, that water filters down through into the very top of our, our uh, aquifer system. That water in the, at the top of the aquifer in much of the valley is not of drinking water quality. And what we've seen is actually an increase in nitrates and other contaminants into that groundwater. It's not just due to septics, it's due to runoff from irrigation and other things. Um, but it is impairing water quality at the, at the top of that aquifer. Um, and then and that could uh, potentially have a negative impact. Uh, the other issue with it is uh, in particular for uh, uh, residences or properties that have municipal water service, so they're not on a well, but they are on a septic system, uh, we now have uh, a, a kind of imbalanced system where we're pulling water from, from the majority of which coming from the Colorado River, but now uh, that water is not being returned to the river in the way that it would with another property that ha is connected to a wastewater system. So the goal of this is to help support uh, folks in Southern Nevada that are on those septic systems and are connected to uh, the uh, uh, drinking water system to get connected to the wastewater system. Close that loop and support recycling our water resources so that we can extend them even further. Uh, and uh, I'll just leave it at that and let others speak to the amendment, which I think uh, is going to help address many of the concerns related to uh, participation and cost of that program. Uh, in addition, um, another major issue that, that we have, again, is the use of grass and turf. And so this bill uh, tunes up some of the, the legislation that we passed last session related to non-functional turf, 
Uh, and, and it goes further by really trying to make sure that we're using the most water efficient turf um, where it does exist uh, in, in these larger patches, uh, that we are taking some of uh, those facilities that have substantial turf and work with them to uh, really efficiently irrigate that. Uh, and in fact, we do have uh, uh, some standards for uh, our irrigation systems to make sure that they're the most water efficient possible. Uh, and then we do have uh, some portions related to being able to take action in times of emergency. And I've heard some, some questions and concerns about this too. You know, this is something that uh, nobody would take lightly, but we have seen over the last few years how quickly the situation on the river can deteriorate, where uh, really uh, states and the federal government have been struggling to keep up. It only takes a few bad years back to back to put us in an extremely precarious position. Uh, and while there are certain things that can be done at the local level, the last thing that we want to see uh, is end up in a situation where uh, our water service becomes unreliable and we cannot be sure that water is going to come out of the tap when somebody turns it on for their most basic necessities. And so, uh, again, taking on conservation measures in turf, taking them on in pools, taking them on in golf courses, taking them on with other uh, large users of water, um, all of those things are in the works. Um, what we're doing is for the, uh, particularly for the largest, uh, a small subset of, of water users in our community who use substantially more than, than the average amount is utilizing a framework that we actually have in Nevada for domestic wells to protect them in times of uh, a shortage in water resources. Uh, to be able to say, if we are facing that situation where uh, our water supply is uh, in, uh, in question that we would have the ability to ask folks to uh, pull some of that back so that they can still, so that everybody can meet their, their critical uh, uh, needs. And so uh, those are some of the, the key things that this bill seeks to do. Um, and, and again, what it really is is about doubling down on uh, the actions that have been taken both at the state level and the local level, uh, making sure that uh, Nevada positions itself uh, as a leader uh, across the region, across the Colorado River Basin, uh, in helping address not only the uh, challenges that we uh, may face down the road in, in meeting our own supply needs, but also addressing the greater uh, challenges that we have in balancing our water supply and our water demand. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to the Water Authority to uh, uh, provide some additional details about the legislation. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Colby Pellegrino, the Deputy General Manager of Resources for the Southern Nevada Water Authority. As always, Assemblyman Watts does a great job of, of speaking my part, so I'm going to skip over um, some of the salient points that I have in my talking point just to say um, that, you know, this allows us to start funding septic conversions voluntarily, and more importantly, it helps prohibit new septic systems from going in. Um, we have always taken this approach with conservation, with making new development smart first, and then figuring out a way to address existing development, and this does exactly that related to septics. Um, we have a very large list of septic owners that want to convert. Um, so this is, in fact, helping those that want to get there um, with the financial assistance portion of the program. Uh, as Howard mentioned, um, this enhances our conservation measures um, and helps reduce demands even further. Uh, we also seek to address development of water systems in areas outlying our um, urban base served by Colorado River water with some of these measures and we're looking for um, the ways that we protect health and human safety. Um, as was mentioned previously. I'm just going to add there for a second that when we talk about the need to be able to reduce water use um, to half an acre foot, this is really about 
protecting our supply in an emergency situation where we have the type of conditions that we currently do not see in policy today, um, having the tool to address the unknown and the uncertain conditions that may exist in the future because of climate change and changing flows on the river. Uh, where we sit last year, we used 224,000 acre feet of our 300,000 acre foot allocation with a maximum reduction in current policy that would take us to 270. We have a very significant buffer between our use and current policy. But what the federal government put forward in their draft supplemental environmental impact statement would reduce Nevada's water use to nearly half of its allocation, requiring us to cut um, significantly into our existing uses. And while we don't agree with that supplemental environmental impact statement, and that's a completely uh, different topic than what we're here for today, uh, we need tools should we ever find ourselves in that sort of emergency management situation. This isn't about taking customers and currently and, and permanently holding them to that volume of water. It's having a tool to use in an emergency situation that we could turn off and turn on. We know that the top 20% of our water users in the single family sector use over 35% of our water use for that sector. Um, with the average home using less than 100,000 gallons of water a year, um, so we know over 50% of our population gets by with less than half of what we're proposing um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is really, again, just that emergency management tool um, should we face some unknown circumstances in the future. Um, I'm going to wrap up and just say that reducing water demands um, is essential for Southern Nevada. We've spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resources continuing to stretch our allocation of the river. We serve seven out of every 10 Nevadans um, with less than 1.8% of the allocated water on the Colorado River. We don't know what the future holds on the river, but we know it's going to be drier and hotter. We know that everyone is going to need to use less water and that requires that we have more flexibility so we can respond in real time to the challenges that we face. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Andy Belanger with the Water Authority here today in support of AB 220, and it falls on me to do the walkthrough of the bill. I will do it as quickly as I can, particularly for those of you who sat through wild horses this morning. I, um, I uh, think you'll, you'll want that. So I'm going to go, I'm going to provide an uh, overview of the components of AB 220. In the first reprint, I'll go through the proposed amendments and I can go into any detail on specific sections as requested. So AB 220 is a comprehensive water bill that makes the following changes. Uh, section one addresses septic systems in the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, it is being proposed to be struck uh, from this bill in its current form and replaced in its entirety with uh, the Senator Wynn Amendment. Uh, so I'll get to that as we get to the amendments. Uh, sections three through 4.5 clarify the obligations of a local governing body when a private water system defaults. We want to make sure that uh, water rate payers are not on the hook for the continued operations and maintenance of a private water system far away from the system that might have a default. And so we've worked with the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection to make sure we've gotten that language correct. Sections 6, 20, 22, and 24 address uh, the water sense, land, land, uh, water sense landscape irrigation fixtures for new developments and requires those for new developments. Uh, the bill makes various changes to water law, and I'll walk through those uh, quickly. Sections 7, 10, and 26 of the bill provide greater clarity on what reasonably available means by replacing the term with a distance requirement. In section 24.5, we received feedback from the Division of Water Resources that they need uh, to exempt the emergency use of water to distinguish fires from the cha uh, NRS Chapter 533. Excuse me. In section 26, uh, we're giving the state engineer greater flexibility in dealing with temporary permits in the Las Vegas Basin while retaining existing protections to domestic well owners. Nothing in this bill changes the state engineer's limitations on revoking domestic wells in the Las Vegas Basin, namely that the well must fail and the property must be within 180 feet. 
Uh, in Section 27, we're replacing an archaic provision that prohibits the plugging of wells and connecting it uh, if the cost is over $200 with a distance requirement. And in Section 23 of the bill, we are specifying that if the state engineer does make that requirement in Section 27, that those properties would be eligible for the state's capital improvement grant program uh, that provides financial assistance. So we're not stranding those people without a funding source uh, to connect them. Uh, sections 12 through 19 and 21 make changes to the tentative and final mapping requirements in Clark County to ensure that the supplier of water confirms that there are adequate water resources for new development. Uh, section 27.5 requires the Colorado River Commission to sign off on changes to Colorado River entitlement holders, uh, changes uh, to make sure that Nevada's Colorado River allocation is protected. Uh, section 29 of the bill does a number of things related to water conservation. And, uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking through that. So this provision authorizes the Water Authority Board, uh, if they choose to do so, to limit single family residential water use to a half acre foot during a federally declared shortage. It does not require the Water Authority Board, which is comprised of local elected officials, to limit residential water use to a half acre foot. It just gives the board one more tool to make sure that all residents have access to water if conditions on the Colorado River worsen. And it treats residential water customers the same way the state treats domestic well owners under curtailment, as Assemblyman Watts mentioned. Uh, like the homeowners you might hear from today, domestic well owners also have large lots, mature trees, and livestock. Even still, the state limits them to a half acre foot during curtailment. And it's time to treat urban water customers the same way we treat rural well users. Our drier future requires all water users to use significantly less water. Uh, sadly, we've heard from some people who've argued that they must be allowed uh, to use more water simply because they have a larger lot, that their situation is unique, and that they should be treated differently during a water crisis. We may actually hear from some of those people today. And I hope we don't, because the scenario in which we would need to employ such a limitation would be when our allocation to the Colorado River is significantly impaired, either by a worsening drought or federal action. In that circumstance, I can't imagine people would argue that their landscaping matters more than their neighbors. Uh, so you might also hear about the excessive use charge that the Water District imposed in January to encourage greater water conservation among our customers. Um, among the top 10% of our water customers. I want to make it clear AB 220 doesn't address that excessive use charge. Uh, but I want to make sure that the committee is aware that the excessive use charge is working. As designed, it was proje projected to affect the top 10% of our water customers. And in practice, it's only affecting the top 6% of customers. So if you hear concerns about that charge today, you can be assured you're hearing from among our largest residential water users. Nearly half of them have changed their beh behavior so that the charge doesn't hit them. And we encourage remaining customers affected by the charge to follow the watering schedule, re reduce outdoor watering, and really consider how much grass they still need. Um, we understand change is difficult. We understand that the situation on the Colorado River is moving quickly. And uh, that's required us to act quickly to address it. Um, we're making hard decisions now to make sure that water is there uh, in our community now and into the future. Um, of course, if the Water Authority Board uh, choosed, uh, chose to impose a limitation, it would require significant public outreach. And we have a history of, of doing that on public policy over the uh, 32 years that the Water Authority has existed. Um, so <clears throat> Section 29, in addition to the half acre foot uh, limitation, uh, also prohibits the installation of new grass served by the Colorado River except in parks, schools, and cemeteries, requires the use of warm season turf and functional turf areas. It establishes a water efficiency monitoring program in Section 30 for non-single family residential properties that have more than 20,000 square feet of turf. It makes minor changes to AB 356 from the previous session to better match legislative intent and clarify that any property or parcel that's not used exclusively as a single family residence is required to remove non-functional turf. That's in section 31. Section 32 and 33 authorize the Las Vegas Valley Groundwater Management Program to establish a voluntary septic conversion program for well owners 
and Section 34 authorizes the Water Authority Board to adopt a resolution allowing the general manager to limit water use during emergencies, but requires that any such restrictions be ratified by the board within 15 calendar days. Um, I think Senator Wynn is here. Um, so we, we can talk through the two amendments that, um, that exist. Um, so would you prefer that I let Senator Wynn address her amendment and then I can walk through the Water Authority one or we can do it either way? Um, Mr. Belanger, why don't you walk through your amendment first and then we'll have Senator Wynn come up and walk through hers. Thank okay. you. So the Water Authority amendment does the following items. It places the existing definition of local governing body from NAC 445A.597 in the statute. Uh, that clarifies what those sections three through five apply to. That's the piece regarding uh, the private water system default. Uh, in section 4.5, uh, we're proposing to clarify that if there's a surplus of assessments and sureties collected to operate and maintain a private water system, that the assessments and sureties are returned to the persons who paid them. And we may need to add the word sureties and once more on page 10, line three, before the words assessment to make sure that the intent of the section, section 4.5 is clear. Uh, we're deleting section eight of the bill. Um, as, as Senator Wynn talks through her amendment, uh, because we're turning this into a voluntary program, because the program uh, no longer uh, has the, the statutory mandates that were in section eight, uh, we're proposing that be removed. I would just incidentally note that that is the section that had existing statutory language regarding liens and criminal penalties. So by removing that section, the bill no longer addresses those items. And then section 34 of the bill, we're clarifying that uh, that is not intended to restrict water use uh, to the U.S. Department of Defense. So I'm happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time, but... Uh, we can now hear from you. Thank you so much. Let's have Senator Wynn come up and share her amendment. Then we'll get any final comments from our presenters, and then I'm sure we'll have a few questions. And thank you. Thank you, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. Um, I apologize that it was a little timely. I was I'm presenting another bill in uh, the Assembly Legislative Operations and Elections <laughs> Committee. So, um, And I just wanted to thank the bill sponsor as well as this committee for allowing me to present this amendment, which I believe is a friendly amendment um, that has been accepted. Um, and I just kind of wanted to walk through this. Over the past few weeks, I've heard from many of my constituents um, about some of the concerns they had. Specifically, it started off with the septic provisions in section one of AB 220. Obviously, continued water conservation is critical for our community, and I've tried to balance the needs of greater water conservation with protections for existing homeowners. I live in a older neighborhood with larger lots, and we have mature trees and mature um, things, so I understand that there are a lot of us that want to engage in conservation efforts, and a lot of times those are unattainable financially. I know they have been for my family, and I know that there are many people in Senate District 3 and around the state that also have those same concerns. Concerns. They want to um, convert um, their to, to sewer from their septic systems, but it's financially unattainable. So in talking, I worked closely with Assembly Members Brown, May, and Newby, as well as Assemblyman Watts, um, to protect constituents who have municipal water connection and a septic tank. So working with the Southern Nevada Water Authority, as well as the bill sponsors and the committees on these, we wanted to have the goal of septic provisions to stretch Southern Nevada's limited water supply by recapturing and recycling all Colorado River water. And while I appreciated the intent of the bill, I also wanted to make sure that we gave people an option to convert before we considered more drastic steps. I think so many of us have turned on the news or seen in the paper pictures of that ring, sink ring around Lake Mead and have serious concerns about water and what our future looks like in this state. And um, I'm sure there are many residents who want to save the Colorado River supply and will connect their properties to sewer, but they should make that choice on their own. So I appreciate the amendment and on, under this, um, there's just a couple of things I wanna go through um, with the amendment with the chair's permission, if that's okay. 
Um, the amendment deletes section one of the first reprint, including all state imposed mandates and deadlines for septic conversions. In the previous um, version that came out of the assembly, there were mandates, there were deadlines for that septic conversion. The new section one creates a voluntary financial assistance program, which will pay 100% of the cost for septic conversion, regardless of the property owner's income. I know at one point there were considerations for um, lower income um, folks that will receive state benefits. There were even um, calculations to increase that to 100,000. Um, but in my mind, some of these conversions could cost potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. And even if you were paying 15% of that, a lot of times that is unattainable. We hear a lot of times, and this cuts across um, our not only our low income folks in our communities, but also our middle and upper income folks. This is a lot of money to be able to expend to become in compliance with this mandate. So I appreciate um, the voluntary nature of this because I know there are a lot of people that do want to make this conversion. They do want to get off their septic before they are forced to do so. And this would allow them to do that as long as there are funds available. And it's my understanding and I'm sure um, some of the other people that are presenting this bill can talk about some of the resources that are out there in the millions of dollars actually um, that are part of a federal and county and statewide like initiative to um, you know encourage and pay for some of these conversion costs uh, to get rid of these septic. I know that in talking to a lot of constituents, especially in the Section 10 and the Section 11 areas of my district in particular, um, they were concerned about this fee to help fund the septic conversions. Um, at this point, with the amendment, it is a voluntary fee that's capped at the annual sewer rate of Clark County Water Reclamation District, which, in, like I said, in Clark County is roughly $250 annually, and that is, again, a voluntary fee that's capped. Um, Septic owners who do not want financial assistance do not have to pay that fee. And I can turn this back over and I'm sure you can follow up with some questions that the committee had. A lot of times people ask me like, is this going to tear up my neighborhood streets? Is this going to tear up my yard? Um, who's going to pay for that? Is it just for this? And I've been assured that as inclusive of those um, provisions of the conversion, it would include the repar the the repairs um, and the damage done not only to community streets but also people's like yards and lawns for that type of repair um, as a part of that. Um, again, um, what I learned, which I didn't know, we're always learning new things, that uh, a lot of these, um, all the septic conversions and septic tanks are not governed by the Southern Nevada Water Authority, but in fact the health districts, the public health districts. And so um, I learned that we are also asking them to report the number of voluntary conversions to the legislature so we can see how many people are taking advantage of this voluntary program to pay for 100% of this conversion. Um, it also deletes, the amendment deletes section 9 and 10 of the bill to make conforming changes to section 1. And this is the one that I know is very concerning for many people. I, I missed a part of the testimony, but I can only imagine we talked about um, the circumstances where there would be limitations to our water um, sources. And so specifically, I had concerns about Section 29 of this bill as it applied. I know that there is a lot of mistrust and there's a lot of unknowns. Um, I know that while there was an open process to discuss some of the rate increases, and that is not what this bill does, um, I, I think a lot of people didn't know about those um, procedures. Um, I think a lot of people didn't know who the, the board was actually made up of elected officials um, throughout Clark County and Southern Nevada that are actually elected and then they're a part of the Southern Nevada Water Authority Board. And they would be making those kind of decisions as well. And so um, I also had talked to um, numerous um, group home owners, as well as people that had larger extended families. For many of you that know, it is me, my husband, my two, um, my 11 year old, my 13 year old, uh, my father and my father-in-law. And we probably use a disproportionate number of water than opposed to like our neighbor who lives by himself. And so we wanted to make sure that in that emergency situation where there was an emergency declaration that we had 
water that was so low that we were worried about providing for public safety and drinking water and flushing toilets and taking showers and doing those kind of essential things, that in addition to that, there would be a waiver program. And initially, we had talked about it being um, they may create a waiver program, and um, with this amendment, um, they shall and they be, would be required to come up with um, whatever that program would look at. And we would ask them to take into consideration things that I think they haven't been taken into consideration in the past, or if they have, we wanted to make sure it's public. Um, for example, um, waivers could be granted for group homes with need for more indoor water and medical purposes. We wanted to make sure that properties um, that had larger families could qualify and would be considered for these waivers. And um, other purposes similar to that, that would be um, taken into consideration. I know that there was a lot of talk in my own neighborhood about heat island effects and the ability to, um, you know, maintain a lot of the mature trees and landscaping that, um, you know, combat that heat effect in our neighborhoods, even with the removal of grasses and other things. And so we just wanna make sure that the Southern Nevada Water Authority Board, when they are creating that waiver, that it is very clear that the legislative intent was to make sure that we take into um, those considerations about group and family homes, um, larger family homes, as well as um, you know the science from our environmental and engineering community about what is needed to protect the overall community um, from other damages other than water. So um, th those are the amendments that I proposed, um, and um, I will turn it back over to Assemblyman Watts to finish up. <laughs> Thank you, Howard Watts for the record. So uh, just very briefly, you, you've heard about what the bill uh, is seeking to do, why it's important. Uh, again, um, we need to be bold, we need to be, uh, we need to be a bit aggressive in, in taking the, some of these measures in Southern Nevada because uh, again, while we've had uh, a little bit of a reprieve, we do have challenges ahead and we need to be ready to face those. At the same time, uh, again, uh, We've heard the concerns that have come from members of the community and, and made adjustments to ensure that uh, some of the potential worst case scenario consequences of this are going to be avoided. Um, you know, I've, I've heard some concerns about uh, uh, everything from growth to the involvement of other sectors other than just residential. And again, I just want to point everyone to the last section of this bill authorizes um, in, in these emergency situations, uh, again, with the approval of a board made up of elected officials to take actions to protect the core water uses of our community. Um, and that's across all levels. So uh, oftentimes this has been portrayed as kind of uh, putting the burden on residential versus everyone else. And I just want to make clear that not only have there been ongoing initiatives at the state and at the local levels to make sure that everybody's doing their part for conservation, um, but that that is definitely uh, uh, included and considered as, as part of this as well. And really a lot of the, uh, all of the uh, turf provisions really relate to some of those uh, larger entities. So I very much appreciate uh, Senator Wynn for uh, working to uh, address uh, some of these concerns. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd uh, be glad to, uh, uh, we'd be glad to answer any questions that members of the committee have. Thank you so much, Assemblyman. Thank you so much to the Southern Nevada Water Authority for clearing up, I think, so, at least hopefully answering some of these questions in advance of testimony. And Senator Wynn, enough can't be stated for yours, for Assemblyman Watts, and for your nested Assembly members for working so hard to come up with this amendment. It's very much appreciated, and I know I've already gotten a lot of feedback by email um, thanking us for the hard work that went into that. Um, that said, committee members, what questions do we have? Um, well, I'll go on the record with a question first, and then I'll, I'll pass it over to my colleagues. Um, you know, something that I've thought a lot about is, 
in the future, if someone were not to take advantage of this voluntary program, which is being paid at 100%, is there a possibility in the future that this could be mandated? So it could be a requirement for residents in Clark County, um, and once these funds are gone, then there would be no coverage for this conversion. Thank you for that question, Madam Chair. Howard Watts, for the record. Um, let me give the technical unsatisfying answer first, which is that we cannot bind the action of any future legislature. Um, so there's, there's no such thing as a permanent guarantee. However, let me speak specifically to this bill. This bill has no provisions within it with the amendment that's been presented to allow for any sort of mandatory program. So as things stand, if we were to pass this measure, the only way that there could be any changes to potentially open the door to uh, uh, a more stringent program would have to come back through this body. Uh, Chair Pazuna, Andy Belanger for the record. You know, one of the things that the amendment does is it removes all of those, as, as Mr. Watt said, removes all of those mandates at the state level. So, you know, there are still health district regulations that would govern and the status quo then returns to what would happen prior to the bill being introduced. So there are still uh, ways that the health district may require a property uh, to connect to the sewer. Um, and those are specified in the ISDS, the Individual Sewage Disposal uh, System Regulations. Uh, what this bill does is it removes those state mandates and, and returns it back to the status quo. Thank you very much for that. I have more questions, but I'm going to hand it over to Senator Hansen for the moment. And thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. A very interesting presentation. We've discussed this at length. I think the whole idea is a good idea. But I can't help but, you know, going over, listening to what you guys said. Stretching our resources, cutting back on sod and unnecessary grasses, metered water use, half acre, acre foot, no new turf, water efficiency mandatory, non-functional turf's gone, conservation measures, stretching our resources. But nobody mentions the fact that all that effort you guys are going through just allows an unlimited number of houses to go in every direction. We got the same problem in the north. I mean, all the people that are going to be talking, at some point they're going to say, you know, why is it I got to cut back and cut back and cut back, but you guys let those developers just go forever? And when I talked to Southern Nevada Water Authority about that, and by the way, I, I realize I'm committing heresy by even daring to bring up the idea that maybe it's time we look at restricting the endless growth in the state of Nevada in areas that, frankly, we don't have the resources to do. And yet, we're going to cut back and cut back and cut off our grasses and trees are going to die and everybody's going to get down to no water, but then you see a constant number of housing tracks going in every direction in the valley. Same in the north, by the way. I live in Spanish Springs and totally changed in my lifetime, totally. So anyway, I'm just kind of wondering, has anybody got, you mentioned bold and aggressive. How bold and aggressive do we really want to be in this uh, legislature? Excellent question, Senator Hansen. Howard Watts, for the record. Uh, let me first say that if you want to jump off that political cliff, I will, I'll hold your hand. <laughs> You're a brave man, Howard. I was going to tell you, all the stuff you've been dealing with, water, horses, all that stuff, you got a lot of guts. It's kind of like pickered with bees. You know? <laughs> I don't appreciate that comparison, Senator, but... <laughs> Sorry. All right, let's... Uh, let's but, but no, I... I Heidi I... Swank and Domestic Wells. There's a pair okay. How's that? <laughs> Again, Howard Watts, for the record, uh, I, I really appreciate that question. I think it's a conversation that we, that we really need to have. I do. Um, and, and I want to put that on the record. I think it is also important to understand that as time has gone on, as technology has improved, we've actually seen uh, a lot of both those who have the financial resources as well as the newer developments really, uh, you know, just again, by nature of improvements in technology and, and practices and understanding of things have uh, reduced in, you know, when we talk about water specifically, have reduced their water footprint and their water consumption. And so is there an impact? Absolutely. Are there impacts outside of just the water consideration? Yes. Um, and would be glad to talk about those at length another time. But, but ultimately, what we have seen is that uh, you know, I mean, now, and I'll, the Water Authority can speak to it because there's they've done more things than I can remember. But limiting the the size of pools, requiring that all new developments have no turf, um, and, and so on and so on, to really again reduce that water consumption 
and, and focus uh, again on the, the water recycling system that we have so that the, the kind of net water used by some of those uh, newer developments is actually substantially less than some of the older, whether it's residential or commercial or other things. And, and while people, uh, you know, push on uh, the use, for example, with the fountains on the Strip, there's a lot of fountains in Las Vegas that have gone away since I was a kid. Um, there's a lot that's been done to reduce the consumptive water use. And, and again, when you think about the number of tourists and economic activity that's generated and the number of jobs that that supports and things, that's, it's just another, uh, another consideration for the value of water. And then we have water use in other uh, commercial uh, uh, facilities, but that supports the needs and activities of the residents. Uh, and so it, it's certainly a complex issue, but what I would say at a high level is that there's already been action to really push down the water use of, of uh, newer development in the community. But again, I'll just close off before uh, at allowing the, the Water Authority to add any of their thoughts and saying that at its core, I, I wholly agree with you. We need to have a conversation about um, managing growth to be more sustainable uh, given our limited resources. All right, well, you know, before anybody ans answers, I I'm way off topic. I know the chair wants us to get back on AB 220, not on the bigger one that we're talking about. But uh, I, I would say, you know, we have beautiful new housing tracks going in. They're going to have no trees, no yards. I mean, there's a quality of life factor that I think we're losing there. But as far as the bill itself, the septic tank conversions, if they're on the well, or if they're already on your water system, you're going to pay 100% of it. It sounds like a very, very good deal. And if I was one of those people in the audience that already have Southern Nevada Water Authority coming to my house, but I'm not a septic tank, I would certainly be very anxious in the next three years to take full advantage of the, uh, if, it, if it's the same after the amendments that you and I talked about, it's a great deal and it, they better do it. So I will say that. But I do think there's a much broader concern all across Nevada with how, how far we can go in the desert with the kind of growth we keep uh, seeing. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Did you want to comment as well? It's Colby Pellegrino for the record. I'll just say that um, the way that the Southern Nevada Water Authority has taken on this issue is to present the community with our water resource plan every year with the roadmap in order to continue to meet the projected population growth. So that is a question that goes to our elected board every single year of are you willing to do these measures in order for us to continue to have a sustainable water supply. If we would have stopped growth at the point that water conservation became necessary, no one would have moved to Southern Nevada after 2002. Every single home business that's come into Southern Nevada since 2002 is because somebody before them has conserved. And a lot of what's left in our conservation bank is changes in behavior. It's not removing turf from single family homes. It's not killing trees. It's the fact that your tree needs to be watered one day a week in the winter, not seven. Um, and that's a lot of what we still have in terms of conservation games is stopping the water waste in the community. Thank you so much to Ms. Pellegrino for sharing that and for sharing some of the work throughout this hearing that SNWA has done to try to conserve water. And it's always nice to see my colleagues from both chambers and both sides of the aisle uh, ready to <laughs> jump into a new venture together. Um, <laughs> Senator Gokachia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, I'm just trying to, I'll be honest with you, trying to put the, the, two pro, the two bills and the amendments together. Just want to make sure I've got it clear in my mind. So, all right, if you're hooked up to municipal water, then uh, you, get, you, you will come in with 100% conversion and hook them up to, and that, that includes uh, abandoning the interceptic. Correct, that's all. All going to be covered. Yeah, Chair Pazina, this is Andy Belanger for the record. Um, and please yes, go direct. Thank you. Yes, that's it's it's still voluntary, right? So if you're on the municipal water and you're on the septic and you choose to uh, want to abandon your septic, then the financial assistance provides 100 percent. It covers your on-site costs, your off-site costs, any repairs to your landscaping, your hardscapes, and any repairs in the street. 
the public right of way. So yes, it would cover 100% of those costs, I including the abandonment of the, the septic to the health district standards. I appreciate you putting that on the record. But then, in the case you opt out, uh, you can opt out even if you're hooked to a municipal water supply. But then I'm going to shift gears a little bit and move to these, and I didn't even realize this term existed, but in your bill there, talking about temporary uh, domestic well permits. Uh, that's kind of a new term, uh, you know, in the rest of the state. Uh, how many of those do you have in place down there? So uh, this is Andy Belanger for the record, and this is subject to uh, correction from the state engineer when he gets up. <laughs> uh, but my, so I used, to, I used to manage that groundwater management program. There's about 5,000 or so domestic wells, and then those temporary permits, roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,700 total permits. About half of those are temporary. Um, and those are permits that were issued after March 25th, 24th, 1955, and then were stopped in April of 1992. So they were issued for about a 40-year period during that time when the Colorado River water uh, from Lake Mead, the facilities were being built um, with the understanding when, the, when that water became available from the Colorado River, they would be revoked. All of the municipal ones, all of the industrial ones were revoked. What remains are uh, residential temporary permits. So the four home cul-de-sacs, the eight home cul-de-sacs that are on community wells, those would be subject to the, that, uh, that new standard that's in uh, section 26. Okay, but not, and then you're telling me <clears throat> there's about 1,700 or so that would would not qualify. They they can maintain their, they're under a temporary permit. Yeah, I, I think it's about half. Uh, Andy Belanger, for the record, about half of those seventeen hundred have temporary okay, permits. About half. The remainder are, uh, are permanent water rights. So, and then I'm still trying to wrap my arms around how many people are we talking out there that would truly, if you're on a domestic, and I, and I agree with my colleague on the end down there, if you're on a domestic well in the Las Vegas Valley, that's probably not a long-term solution, uh, you know, given the drought scenario where it is, but. Uh, but you've got approximately 5,000 you, you anticipate that are there in the valley. You're, they're on a septic? They're on their own well? That's correct. And, and accord, um, Madam Chair Andy Belanger, for the record, uh, according to this bill, uh, they're not required to get off of their domestic well, and they're not required to get off of their septic. Uh, an earlier version of the bill, as introduced, removed the 180 feet and the well having to fail as the criteria for revocation. That's been reinstated into the bill so that it's very clear domestic well owners are under the same rules that they've been under since 1999 when that was first put in. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, Vice Chair Scheibel. Thank you. I, I do also have a couple of questions, but I wanted to put a, a fun fact about saving water on the record. We could all reduce our water consumption by at least half or possibly more by going vegan. <laughs> Howard volunteers first. <laughs> <laughs> I would hold his hand and jump off that cliff too. Um, and I wanted to ask a little bit more about the uh, section 29, I think it is, and the uh, authorizing language for SNWA or any other, I, I, first of all, I think it is any other author, water authority as well to implement policies that restrict the use of water. And I wanted you to kind of clarify for us, um, number one, that first the federal government, sorry, the federal government has to, is it declare has to change our allocation, declare a shortage, sorry, declare a shortage on the Colorado River which would affect our allocation, right? Howard Watts for the record. Thank you, Senator, for that question. Yes, that's correct. So the federal government would have to declare a shortage. Uh, we are actually in a shortage right now. Um, however, as Ms. Pellegrino noted, uh, currently we are well, even with, it, with that shortage declared and even with uh, additional shortages declared based on the current existing guidelines, at this time, we are well under uh, the point where that would impact the water supply. So, uh, and I just wanna make it extremely clear and I'll probably ask the Southern Nevada Water Authority to speak after me so that they, they can put it on the record directly as well. 
the intent is not to go turn around and do this. It's not the intent to do this to facilitate additional growth. We want to make sure that we have a sustainable water supply, and that is not a sustainable behavior to uh, to clamp down on uh, folks' general residential use um, uh, and an, on an ongoing basis. As Ms. Pellegrino noted, there are a lot of additional conversations and negotiations going on along the Colorado River to bring it into, uh, uh, hopefully, balance. That will certainly, I think, in my opinion, result in deepening what those, sh those potential cuts to our state are going to be. Um, there are proposals out there that could lower them to the point where they would impact the amount. They would cut into the water that we are using in our community today. And so, and again, I just also want to note that within the last few years, we have seen, we have had to scramble uh, as the states in the Colorado River Basin to put in contingency plan after contingency plan because the previous contingency plans that we had turned out to not be enough. They failed faster than we hoped for, planned for, expected, and we had to to uh, react quickly to deal to deal with that, and this is really tied to that. If conditions degrade very quickly, there are changes in kind of the river management, uh, and, and we need to. Uh, and all of a sudden, we're looking at not having enough water to meet all the needs in the community. We need to be able to go and say, "Hey, um, we we're going to need to make some cutbacks here." And that waiver program ensures that you know, those group homes aren't going to be impacted. People have pets that they've got to keep, uh, uh, take care of, uh, uh, that, that those animals aren't going to be impacted, that, you know, it, you know, in those extenuating circumstances that they're not going to be impacted. But, you know, quite frankly, if, if the landscaping is going to suffer, I mean, this has happened all over the world. And it, has happen it happened in California a few years ago where there had to be cutbacks on some of those irrigation uses uh, temporarily to make sure that the drink the drinking water the water for uh, health and safety are protected and uh, the last thing that I'd add is again section 34 of the bill also authorizes during a shortage general uh, actions to help protect the water supply so this is this is not about singling out and punishing residential users we are using uh, again a very similar uh, kind of structure that we have to protect domestic well users all across the state if there's a curtailment in water usage uh, and, and applying that to residential but we're not singling them out at the expense of everyone else if we end up in this scenario we're going to be asking everyone to tighten their belts to make sure that the critical uses for our community are protected and with that I turn it over if the water authority has anything to add or to clarify specifically on the record the intent with how this may be utilized. This is Colby Pellegrino for the record, and I'll just confirm the intent is an emergency management nature. So if we had to reduce our use below our existing use or reduce our use in a very rapid fashion, that it's a tool to use in our toolbox temporarily, not a permanent management strategy. I have a couple of follow-ups that I wanted to also get on the record here that, um, first of all, like we just discussed, the, the federal government has to make its determination, which you mentioned has already happened, but, we're, but then we also have to meet the threshold that we're actually unable to keep up with the water supply. Um, I didn't phrase that quite right, but you're all nodding like you understand what I meant. Um, and then before the board could even implement this, first of all, it's not an automatic trigger. It's not like, okay, now everybody's curtailed to half an acre foot. This just says that now the water authority can open the conversation and start the process, which I assume is a well-established public process to discuss options. And it, it might not be curtailed to half an acre foot. It might be an acre foot or it might be some other policy, not even a curtailment policy, but this allows them to start developing a plan through the normal public process. Am I reading that right? Howard Watts, for the record, thank you for the question, Senator. That's absolutely correct. So speaking to Section 9 in particular, uh, you'll see uh, uh, 
if the federal government declares a shortage on the Colorado River for the upcoming year, the Board of Directors, so again, that's the Board of Directors of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. That is a board made up entirely of local uh, elected officials in, in Southern Nevada. Uh, so they would be the ones to take action. That would come, I'm sure, after many meetings, probably some public workshops as well, and would be uh, uh, that a decision would come up at a public meeting of the board, which would be fully noticed in compliance with open meeting law um, uh, for the, con the consideration of that. And then again, um, speaking to the kind of other uh, uh, section of this in uh, section 34, again, um, actions would have to be ratified by the board of directors. So there is certainly uh, that transparency uh, in terms of notice and process and this is something that if it were to be used i expect well in advance there would be again there'd be public meetings there would be uh quite a bit of press coverage um, and then there would be the standard requirements in terms of noticing the meeting and allowing um, members of the public to make their voices heard Uh, thank you, Chair Pazina, Andy Belanger, for the record. Um, and I also just want to note that the Water Authority Board at every single meeting receives an update on the status of what's going on in the Colorado River that in a public meeting. So we do have people who attend those meetings regularly to hear that update. And so, you know, these sorts of things would be discussed in advance of that action happening. At multiple meetings, the press is always there and typically reports on what's happening on that, at that meeting. So there is usually a, a pretty good um, on-ramp for those kinds of things. And one more follow-up. So uh, the, the worst has happened. The federal government has declared the shortage. We've also determined that we can't keep up with it. And the Water Authority has had its meetings, and they have made a decision, and the decision is to... Uh, limit water to half an acre foot per person and there's a waiver process which either I've applied for and been denied or I didn't realize I should have applied for and so let's say that I am a single residence household and I utilize my half an acre foot by the 20th because it's or whatever. I utilize my half an acre foot before the, the time period elapses and um, is my water just, am I going to turn on the tap one day and the water is going to come out or is the enforcement mechanism something else? Colby Pellegrino for the record, the enforcement mechanism would likely be a flow limiting device. So it would be something that still allows you to get enough water for your basic health and human safety needs. Um, would be the way that we would likely implement it. The only thing that I would add, because I think it's important for the previous question, is a, a lot of these authorities already exist for our member agencies. What's so important about these two sections is they allow us to implement these things uniformly across all of the member agencies at once. Instead of this having to go to four or five boards to implement, it allows in that emergency situation for cohesive policy for everyone using our Colorado River supplies. Okay, thank you so much. I am eager to get to testimony. So I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to have everyone take a step back. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading about septic systems with this bill coming up in addition, obviously, to the legislation itself. So one question I had, and it could be a very small percentage, I'm just curious, um, a potentially, I would imagine most are in good working order, but failing septic systems that are currently in Clark County because it's obviously a concern that the contaminants can then be leaking into the ground and getting into other water sources for neighbors. So that's a concern as well. I don't know if there's any idea of how many failing septic tanks might be in Clark County or how many people that might affect. Colby Pellegrino for the record. I don't, we don't have that information. That would be the Southern Nevada Health District. I think it goes without saying that a septic system does require costly maintenance and replacement in order to keep it so that that doesn't happen. Um, and that's not very well enforced today, which is why we have some of the problems we have. Okay. Thank you so much. And we'll have you take a step back from the hot seats right now. We really appreciate all of the presentation and everything that you're all trying to do to help us with water conservation. And we are going to now welcome those in support of AB 220 to step forward. I would remind everyone 
who plans on testifying that pursuant to Nevada Revised Statutes NRS 218E.085, it's unlawful for a person to knowingly misrepresent facts when testifying before a legislative committee. A person who knowingly does so is guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, in addition, both the chair and members may request any testifier to submit documentation supporting your testimony. So with that, I thank you all. Please keep it to two minutes, and I couldn't be more grateful to have such wonderful turnout here in Las Vegas and on the phones. We'll get started in Carson City. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. For the record, Danny Thompson, representing Operating Engineers Local 12. I served on the ERPAC committees for the Water Authority, both of them that they did. I served on the Drought Committee, and I think something, some, a, a piece that's missing here that I don't think everyone understands. 90% of our water comes from Lake Mead. We get a 300,000 acre foot allocation. Uh, um, Arizona gets 2.8 million acre feet. California gets 4.4 million acre feet. The way we survive now is that we take that water, we treat it, and we put it back. I think we're the only uh, county in the nation that does that. Literally all of the water is returned except for water that is used in other places. So if you're using, if you're taking water out of the allocation and you're watering grass with it or you're putting it in a septic tank or some other use that doesn't allow us to get those return flow credits, it's a double impact because the way we survive now is do we put the water back and take it again and it's a, a return flow credit situation. There is, there is proposals right now the Bureau of Reclamation is looking at that if the lake, the, the lake today is at 1,051 feet. If the lake gets the 950 feet elevation, Hoover Dam will no longer work. At that point, uh, the, the, the proposal right now would cut, our, there's two of the proposals they're looking at would cut our allocation in half. And so that would be very draconian for us. And so it's critically important. And I, we support the bill uh, as amended to pay for the 100% of, uh, of the renovations to make that happen. I think it's a very good thing and to serve everyone well. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the committee, Kyle Rohrink with the Great Basin Water Network. We support AB 220 and you know, want to echo what Mr. Thompson just said. And it was interesting. After the assembly hearing, I saw him in the halls and I said, you know, what do we think about this? And he said, if we can't pass a sewer bill, you know, we're in trouble here. And, and I, I really agree with that sentiment, and especially considering you know, the crisis that we've heard about on the Colorado River. We have to understand the symbiotic relationship between one part of the state and all other parts of the state. And so it is time to be bold, as, uh, as Assemblyman Watts said. And I think it's also important to think about the future. We're talking about these regulatory proposals. Um, we, we, we've lost 20% of the river since the year 2000. We're likely to lose 20% more in the coming decades. That's what the top scientists on the river are saying. So what are we doing to prepare right now? And I think AB 220 is the, uh, is the ultimate way that, uh, that we prepare. And we have an obligation to do so. Um, I think it's also important to touch on Section 14. Uh, I've seen some opposition uh, uh, toward that section, and I think if you all look at NRS 2780228 sub 1 sub C, it really answers all the all the questions about that. And I think some of uh, that opposition on that section uh, are just uh, really shameful red herrings. So, uh, really appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. My name is Jane Amon, and I'm the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. We are testifying in support of Assembly Bill 220. Water sustainability is crucial for nature and for people, particularly in an arid state like Nevada. The Colorado River is a critical piece of Nevada's water budget, supplying most of the water in southern Nevada. But the Colorado River is in crisis, facing an unprecedented challenge as a result of 23 years of prolonged drought and rising temperatures due to climate change. This means less water in rivers for agriculture, for wildlife, and for people. In the face of unpredictable climate and weather, we must do more with the two things that we can control. One, water demands on the system, and two, the pace of implementing solutions. At the Nature Conservancy, we broadly support water conservation efforts that benefit nature while sustainably managing the resource. Every drop of water counts, and we appreciate that SNWA is taking proactive measures to save water where it can. 
Having said that, we also strongly believe that true water conservation means keeping more water in the system. Using water savings from conservation measures, such as those proposed in AB 220, to justify irresponsible growth like sprawl development is not conservation. As our great state grows and diversifies its economy, it's imperative that water security and equity for the Colorado River Basin as a whole underscore those decisions. Regarding the water restrictions described in section 29, we ask that the mandatory water restrictions be done in tandem with long-term care and maintenance of the existing and planned urban tree canopy. TNC recommends that the implementation of restrictions on single family residences should provide tools and resources for homeowners to effectively comply with them. For example, single family residences could have access to water audits for their priorities with technical and financial assistance for complying with restrictions. The Nature Conservancy is committed to balancing supplies and demand in the Colorado River. We think that AB 220 can help do that in the system. We urge your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Nicole Rourke, representing the city of Henderson, here in support of AB 220. Along with SNWA and our Southern Nevada partners, we have been focused on water conservation for more than two decades, which has allowed us to grow while using less water. As mentioned earlier, we have a new regional water conservation goal to achieve a reduction from our current 112 gallons per capita per day to 86, and Henderson has been actively participating in these efforts. Last year, we created our Climate Response Initiative, incorporating 14 strategies to reduce the city's consumptive water use, ranging from amplified outreach and education for the community, accelerated removal of non-functional turf, an expanded incentive program, increased watering compliance, and new regulations. We're specifically focused on reducing wasteful outdoor use by ensuring compliance with watering restrictions and removing non-functional turf. We've also increased rates for mega users to encourage them to scale back. As a city, we consumptively used 1.3 billion gallons less water in 2022 than we used in 2021. The City Council approved an amendment this month to, uh, last month actually, to uh, the Henderson Municipal Code for golf courses to align with SNWA's recommendation for the reduction of golf, golf, uh, golf course water budgets. We've also implemented LIDAR, light detection and ranging technology, and aerial imagery to help detect leaks within our system. Water conservation efforts are more critical than ever, as you've heard, and we must continue to inform and engage our community. We are committed to the standards that will sustain our community for generations to come and recognize the changes in AB 220 that are aligned with this goal. Therefore, the City of Henderson um, is here to support not only AB 220, but also the amendments that have present, been presented to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rock. We're going to take two more down here in Carson City. Then we're, you're welcome to come right on up to the table. We're going to take everyone, but we're going to move after you two down to Las Vegas and then to the phones. Hello, Chair and Committee members. My name is Sam Anastasados. Um, that's spelled A-N-A-S-T-A-S-S-A-T-O-S. -S so the and, common spelling? <laughs> yeah, how you would think it was spelled. Um, testifying today on behalf of the Environmental Defense uh, Action Fund, who supports AB 220. At EDF Action, we are deeply concerned with the state of the Colorado River. This river is a lifeline for the Southwest that supports 40 million people, 16 million jobs, 11 national parks, 29 tribes, and 5.5 million acres of farmland. It isn't news to anyone here that the Colorado River is in trouble. <clears throat> AB 220 shows that Nevada is serious about dealing with the water crisis head on, despite having the smallest allocation of any state. If passed, this bill will be one more Nevada example that other states should follow to reduce water, and use, uh, water use and conserve more water in the river. Whether it is removing non-functional turf or capturing more wastewater, Nevada commands other states' attention. Um, we also want to thank everyone who worked to amend this bill so that ordinary folks are not hit with unreasonable costs. With these amendments, we think AB 220 can help ensure a Nevada where both people and nature can thrive. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Candace Townsend, and I represent the City of North Las Vegas, and we are testifying today in support of AB 220. Thank you. Thank you so much. And as we continue, if anyone would like to ditto or echo comments, we welcome you to do that. But right now, we're going to move to Las Vegas. Thank you, Chair Pazina. Amber Stidham with the Las Vegas Global Economic Alliance, for the record. Um, in a nutshell, 
Ditto. Um, I would say that uh, Danny Thompson said it best for us, and in terms of our organization, our interest is in uh, providing the infrastructure and water stability that we need. Separate from this conversation, our organization is committed to working together with SNWA and has been in trying to evaluate how we can find better fit partners for us in the economic development space in terms of water consumptive water usage. So just in general, we're in support of this measure. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Azeem Jessa, and I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Realtors. The Realtors are here in support of AB 220. We appreciate the Southern Nevada Water Authority for working with us to help homeowners switch from septic tank to sewer in a manner that allows homes on septic systems to continue to maintain value and be marketable. Without the program to cover the conversion costs, nearly 15,000 homes in Southern Nevada would have lost $100,000 or more in value overnight and potentially triggered a sudden spurt of short sales if the owners faced any sort of economic hardship in the near future. In addition, well-established neighborhoods would have become stigmatized, leading to a dramatic decline in property tax revenue and overall neighborhood blight. Thank you for taking the time to hear our concerns and working with us throughout this process. The Nevada Realtors strongly urge your support. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone else in Las Vegas who'd like to testify in support? Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Yvette Williams. Um, I live in section 11 and I am very proud that my senator that represents our district is Senator Wynn. Thank you so much Senator Wynn for listening and hearing our concerns. Uh, we are, um, my husband and I, I'm going to speak for my husband and I can't speak for the whole neighborhood although many neighbors have expressed um, their excitement about the amendment that you have brought forward. It does address many of the issues um, that we had, uh, particularly in making this a volunteer program and uh, providing 100% funding uh, for those who do want to connect. I'm not in love with my septic tank. I'm very excited about being able to connect to the public sewage. However, I am still very much concerned about the waiver process and what those waiver will be, um, who gets waivers and who doesn't. Um, I have, my lot is, uh, what my home was built in 1978. Uh, I have 17 redwood trees on my, on my property. Um, and um, we have a drip system, uh, but I got my, uh, the excessive fees are a concern for me uh, because I just got my recent bill and my excessive fees are higher than my actual water bill. And I know other neighbors have expressed the same issue. So I'm concerned about what authority, Southern Nevada Water Authority, is granted in this bill um, related to that. So, um, but in spite of that, there are so many other great things that in these amendments we've decriminalized. We won't be criminalized now. Uh, you won't uh, cut off access to our septic tanks that was in the previous bill. Uh, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, and so I just want to commend um, uh, Senator Wynn and those who worked on this amendment uh, and uh, have moved now from strongly opposing uh, to supporting Assembly Bill 220 with those amendments. So if the amendments are there, of course, I no longer support it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. And I think my favorite phrase of this hearing so far is I'm not in love with my septic tank. <laughs> So thank you very, very much. Um, we are going to move to BPS. Um, do we have anyone on the phones in support of AB 220 BPS? If you would like to testify in support of AB 220, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hello, this is Peter Guzman, president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce. In respecting everybody's time, I'm gonna limit my comments to a little shorter and stick to the business side of it. AB 220 requires all members of the community, including the businesses in Southern Nevada, to conserve our constrained water resources. The Las Vegas business community continues to do its part in helping conserve water, and this bill is no different as this bill addresses water use in new development and also requires large commercial users to participate in irrigation monitoring plans. As the water levels in Lake Mead continue to decline, it is anticipated that Southern Nevada will face more cuts 
to its Colorado River allocation, and AB 220 continues to keep Nevada water secure in the face of those cuts. The continued sustainability and viability of our community relies on the ability of the Southern Nevada Water Authority to provide clean, reliable drinking water to over 2.3 million residents and over 40 million visitors to Southern Nevada. Addressing the continuing drought requires all sectors of our community, including the business sector, to, to participate to ensure a, sustain, a sustainable future for Southern Nevada. I thank you again for allowing the Latin Chamber of Commerce to testify in support of this work. Thank you. Chair Pazina and members of the committee, my name is Tracy Puckett, that's T-R-A-C-Y-P-U-C-K-E-T-T, -T, a volunteer member of the Sierra Club's Legislative Committee and a 30-year resident of Clark County. On behalf of the club, the world's largest environmental volunteer organization, and our more than 30,000 members and supporters statewide, I'm speaking in support of Bill AB 220. I'm going to shrink my testimony. However, it is posted on Nellis and say ditto to everybody who is supporting this bill. And we appreciate the amendments to assist our Las Vegas neighbors to convert their septic to sewer. Um, and I appreciate all the work that's being done to help us continue to be able to live our lives in Southern Nevada. Have a good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Patrick Donnelly, Great Basin Director with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we support AB 220. And we feel it gives the Southern Nevada Water Authority the tools they need to effectively respond to drought and emergencies. This is essential to securing a water future for Las Vegas. The Colorado River situation is bad right now, and it's only going to get worse. The Southern Nevada Water Authority needs the tools in place to manage demand in Las Vegas during emergency drought conditions, and this bill does just that. And this issue has important environmental ramifications, too. In SUNWA's water resource plan, we can see that decades in the future, there is a need for a future undetermined supply of new water. Bending down the demand curve in Las Vegas will forestall the day when SUNWA needs to start searching for new supplies of water and any potential environmental concerns that may bring. So this bill has important uh, beneficial environmental considerations as well. And with regard to Senator Hansen's comments about unsustainable growth, uh, we fully agree. And if the good senator would like to join us in our campaign to stop Congress from selling off public lands for new sprawl development in Clark County, we'd welcome his participation. Thank you. Such an interesting hearing. Thank you so much, Mr. Donnelly. I believe we have two more in support on the phone. So let's go ahead and take those callers and then we'll come back to Carson City. Hello, Chairwoman Passini and committee members. For the record, my name is Michelle Tombari. M-I-C-H-E-L-E-T-O-M-B-A-R-I. -E -E I opposed AB 220 at its assembly hearing because of the septic removal mandate. Amendments here have made the bill much better. I appreciate that. Thank you for doing that. Um, I still do have a few questions that I didn't hear answered during the testimony. So I'm a little confused. Uh, is the fee paid every year or is it a one-time fee? And then my second concern is uh, I do live in a county island in Las Vegas, and I want to make sure that uh, if I do accept this program, that my property will not be annexed into the city. So those are my two remaining concerns. Um, I did have a question, too, about um, when Senator Wynn said if the funds are available. That scared me a little bit because you're doing all this work, and hopefully the funds are there. So. That was another comment I had. So again, thank you for improving this bill. Um, I do support it now. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would encourage you to reach out to SNWA. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer those questions. And we can also ask some of those at the tail end of the hearing. Thank you for your call. I believe we have one more caller. 
Good afternoon, Chair Pazina and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mary Beth Seewald, President and CEO of the Vegas Chamber. The Vegas Chamber is in support of Assembly Bill 220 because it effectively balances conservation efforts and water resource needs in Southern Nevada. This bill also allows for sustainable growth and economic development efforts to continue in our community. The Chamber has been a longtime proponent of conservation effort, efforts spearheaded by the Southern Nevada Water Authority. The sound and balanced water policy is critical to all Southern Nevada residents and businesses. It also is essential to community stability and preserving the environment. We believe this bill is necessary as we enter the 23rd year of drought management along the Colorado River. As you've heard today, the water bill and its amendments address issues related to the conversation of septic tanks by making them optional and not a mandate. The adoption of water smart standards and new construction, groundwater management, administration of wells, the irrigation of non-functional turf, and participation in a water efficiency monitoring program. Thank you so much for your time and consideration today in supporting Assembly Bill 220. Thank you. Thank you so much. BPS, I believe that closes out our callers in support of AB 220. Is that correct? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right, let's return Mr. Rogan with you here in Carson City. Thank you, Chair Pazina and members of the uh, Senate Natural Resources Committee. My name is Jeff Rogan. I represent Clark County. I would just ditto every comment that was made in support of this bill, but I would add one thing, and that is really to commend uh, Assemblyman H uh, Watts, but also the Southern Nevada Water Authority. They have been a leader in water conservation for over 20 years. Every time I read in national news media about the efforts the Southern Nevada Water Authority has made over that time to conserve water, I feel a bit of personal pride and I think that uh, AB 220 is well in line with their expertise on water conservation and I trust that AB 220 is something that is important for water conservation in the future. Uh, thank you for your time. I urge your support on AB 220. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy cabrera Georgeson, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Nevada Conservation League. We are here in strong support of AB 220. We'll echo many of the comments that were previously made. Our water resources are precious, and we should be making any effort to conserve water wherever possible. We urge the committee's support. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Josh Hicks, H-I-C-K-S. I'm with McDonald Carano. I represent the Southern Nevada Home Builders Association, the advocacy group for the home building industry in Southern Nevada. Uh, somebody had to come up and make the pro-growth argument, so uh, that's what I that's what I will do. Um, we we support this bill. View it as part of a responsible water use uh, planning for both the present uh, and the future. Uh, it's it's important to note. It was mentioned earlier. Um, new homes are very water efficient. They're they're more and more water efficient uh, every year. Uh, codes are passed. Technology gets better. Uh, and that's what we see, and that's particularly important in southern Nevada with the water issues uh, down there. And the, uh, the consumptive use of water is really the problem, and I think that's what this bill is aimed at, and that's why we support it. The non-consumptive use is what you see in a lot of new homes. Uh, so we try to limit the consumptive use, uh, maximize the non-consumptive use, recycle that water, uh, and that's what new homes are doing in southern Nevada. So we support this bill. It, it limits that, uh, that use of the consumptive water. Uh, and it supports water conservation measures. Support the bill. Thank you. Thank you. So you're saying you won't join Senators Hansen, Assemblyman Watts, and Patrick Donnelly in this new venture. Thank you. No, I'll, st I'll stay off that cliff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee, staff. I'm Zach Bucher with the City of Las Vegas. Brevity is not one of my many talents, but I will be quick here. I'll echo the comments from my uh, local municipalities. Uh, we're here in support of this bill and the proposed amendments we heard today. Thank you. All right, seeing no one else here in Carson City, I don't believe I see anyone else coming to the front in Las Vegas. BPS, just to confirm, no one else has joined us in support on the phones. Is that correct? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right, wonderful. At this point, then, we will close testimony in support of AB 220, and we will open testimony in opposition of AB 220. We'd ask anyone here in Carson City and Las Vegas to come to the tables in the front.
and we'll go ahead and get started in Carson City. And I thank everyone who's in Las Vegas because I really appreciate that you're passionate about this issue that will affect your community and that you came here to learn more. So please know how much we appreciate your being here today. And we'll go ahead and get started in Carson City. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Mary Przinsky, and I'm speaking today on behalf of SNAP, the, Southern, uh, the State of Nevada Association of Providers. SNAP is comprised of organizations uh, that are uh, licensed under the Aging and Disability Services, and they contract with them to provide necessary services such as job uh, training and 24-hour residential care to adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. These residential services are called supporting living arrangements and they're described in NRS 435. They're 100% funded by Medicaid. Unlike the average home, SLAs have a much higher use of, of water. In many SLAs, there are hygiene concerns due to incontinence. This leads to the need for frequent bathing and washing machines that often must run all day in compliance with uh, requirements to wash individuals' clothing and, and bedding separately. Even meals require more water. We know uh, through an internal so uh, survey that even with uh, very little or no grass, some of these licensed homes are above the limits that are outlined in Section 29. While we so much appreciate the understanding of the unique needs of those uh, the SLA serves, we are reluctant to support the bill fully as there is no assurance the current or future boards of the Southern Nevada Water Authority will provide a waiver for us. The state has no other housing for these intellectually and developmentally disabled individuals except for the SLAs. We feel in their interest, we must get these concerns on the record. We appreciate so much the work of Senator Nguyen, Andy Bellinger, and Chauncey Chine for trying to work with us and appreciate them even citing of, uh, the example of these group homes uh, in, their in their testimony. But unfortunately, at this point, we uh, must oppose the bill without specification of an exemption. Thank you so much for letting me testify. I appreciate it. All right. With that, we will move to Las Vegas. Good afternoon. I'm Laura McSwain. I'm uh, here as president of the McNeil Estates Neighborhood Association. Um, I'm not going to say that we're opposed to the bill entirely. It seems that a lot of good work was done to help further the cause of um, conserving water and dealing with the septics, uh, dealing with people who would suffer financial hardship if they had to be forced to convert, excuse me, to convert. However, our concerns lie primarily with, um, I get put my glasses on, sorry, uh, in section 29. Um, you know, the devil is in the details and the concern that we have is that uh, there really are no details. Um, having a sweeping plan, um, the, com the comment was made about a lack of trust, and yes, we, we have a little bit of a lack of trust uh, right now. Um, we have been very impacted by the excessive use charge. Um, shame on us, I suppose, for not really recognizing the implications of that. However, you know, I'm familiar, we're in, I'm in construction, um, I'm not going to jump off the cliff, but um, we, um, we understand that conservation is very, very important, but we also have to look at the, uh, the bigger picture from our neighborhood, from our canopy, our urban uh, legacy canopies. Um, when we went to our, we went to a meeting yesterday, uh, some of our neighbors to testify about our concerns about the bills. Some neighbors have had their bills double. And so, and we can already see stress in our neighborhood uh, as a result of um, people just basically not being able to afford the additional water fees. So we are very, very concerned about what that, uh, the ecological impacts, not just on our neighborhood, but on the valley as a whole. Um, you know, green, uh, big trees and greenery ushers in rain and uh, it, it creates balance, it cleans the air. Uh, the benefits are, are immeasurable. So, um, 
uh, what what became uh, we thank you uh, so much you're over two minutes I, so if you can just close it out so we yeah, can hear if I could because I am representing about 600 homes um, what came out of that meeting is that we have uh, that, that there's a 10-year water supply so I don't understand why we would put this kind of broad language uh, in a bill where because to say that, to say that you need a tool uh, I believe that this board should retain the boundaries of the authority that you have and not give it away absent very, very specific details about what the implications are. I appreciate Senator Wynn, she, her, in the amendments that, language that she's provided, but the board of directors may establish a process to approve a waiver absent knowing what those uh, requirements would be, how we would apply, what the time frame would be. It just seems like because of the way this is written, um, that this should be able to fall under the normal processes that fall within your responsibilities as a board to look at this in a legislative Thank session. Thank you so much. We're going should to have you, session. we would like so, you to go ahead okay. and bring all that testimony because what you're saying is so important. What we'd like to have you do is provide that to the committee secretary so we can get all of this on the record and then all of the committee will review your comments in their entirety because again they are so important you've gone at about three and a half minutes and i've kept everyone else under two minutes so if you have about 10 seconds to finish up for us and then if you don't mind providing those um, written comments to the committee secretary so we can make sure everything's on the record for the committee to review well right now i've just got a bunch of scribble i can submit something later and i did submit something for the record um uh and i don't know if it made it in i'll i'll check on that did it um, but again, if we could just strike this language, uh, all the changes, all the other amendments, and uh, let's look at these tools in their entirety at an appropriate time. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And with that, we are going to, understanding you represent so many of your neighbors, we wanted to make sure you had the extra time to speak. But we do ask that everyone keep this to around two minutes. We are facing our deadlines right now here in the legislature, and I apologize, it's so challenging when you meet for 120 days every other year. So thank you so much, and we'll go to our next resident. Hello, my name is Alicia Sanchez Revzin, and I am a young mother of two young children that are four and seven years old. My household, I am also Hispanic, which in our culture, it is very common to have families come and live with us for two to three months out of the year. That is how the community works. When we are hit with these additional fees and fines due to excessive use, it is hard to be measurable. The other situation that I'm gonna talk about is other friends and other women who are supporting multi-families in their homes. Their water bill over this last month was over $600 for a single mother. These fees were not, um, you guys did not do the proper notification to the public to let the public know, nor did you give us time to adjust to pay to remove grass and trees. We have been slapped with these fees there is no plan in place so that we could have a voice in how we can even stand against these situations and placing an extensive hardship. This money that is going directly into my water bill is taking away from my opportunity to spend money into the city. It is also taking away from education and it's also taking away from other children, <laughs> including my own children. I know this bill isn't amended, for these situations, but it needs to be brought up and it needs to be readdressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Christian Salmon, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N, Salmon, S-A-L-M-O-N. I work with various people throughout the community. We have about, uh, we estimate 18,000 homeowners that are affected by this bill. Um, we appreciate the amendments that are put forward by uh, Senator Wynn and also the SNWA, um, and, but there's some areas that still need to be uh, dealt with. Water usage, we were talking about half acre feet. If we could change that to the size of lot be considered as well as the number of people and animals, I think that would, uh, something like that would help. Uh, the bill language, as other people have attested to, is very uh, vague, not specific. We would like it to be more detailed and whether uh, 
and not delegate authority to the local government that's wondering what's going to happen with that. Um, uh, local, we would like to see a local oversight by property owners. So if the bill sections that delegate authority or that have vague language or are kept as they currently are, then please create a board made up of affected property owners only uh, that will oversee any authorized changes. Um, another part of the bill is it gives the SNWA a monopoly uh, regarding water usage. Currently they have to go to the state engineer. I think it's more appropriate to have a balance of power. I think they can work together to make things work qu quickly if there's an emergency. If they, if they declare emergency on the Colorado River in one year, then it affects the next year. They have to do it by October and then it becomes effective the next year. So these, uh, I, I don't see why we should take away balance of power. Um, also, um, Normally when a developer is, is in, in a neighborhood is, wants to put up a building or a developed property, there's a neighborhood meeting. None of that was done here. Um, it, we ju it just came on the scene when we had the first assembly meeting and all of a sudden we realized what was going on. There are still people that are finding out about this bill. Um, I, although I, I reached out to Mr. Watts, I did not hear back from him. I do appreciate, though, a a Andy Belanger, we've been working to work on some of these issues. I appreciate that. One Sir, I'll tell tension. you what, we're well over yes. two minutes right now, so if you can give your closing thought for us, that would be wonderful. And please, please provide this to the committee secretary so that we have your testimony in writing to review. I will. I appreciate it. There's one last thing. I understand, like, Section 10, people that have septics are covered, but people that have well and septic are not. They're covered at 85%. They're covered under a different program. And for somebody like me that has a, two septics in a well, let's say it costs 300000 at 15%, that's going to be $45,000. i would have to pay out of my pocket, even though if, if, saying I'm within a certain amount of distance of water. So these are some things that we need to Thank uh, you so clarify. much. Point, can I ask for a point of order, though, on Sir, that? I'm so sorry. No, sure this is correct. just testimony right now. So we really appreciate this. I want you to send all of this into the committee secretary so we have it on the record. And as Mr. Belanger has been wonderful with reaching out to the community. I would recommend that you reach out to him and he can probably answer some additional questions. We hope you stay and continue to watch the rest of testimony as I'm sure some more questions will be answered at the end. After the next um, person presents his testimony, we're going to move to the phones. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Edward Hagen, E-D-W-A-R-D, H-A-G-E-N. -E uh, I've learned a lot listening to all of your testimony, uh, but there is something that was a constant theme, water users use water, and uh, the person who spoke for the nat uh, Nature con Conservatories uh, in summary said halfway measures only get you halfway. Uh, your testimony begged the question of is there a a problem on the river or is there a crisis and my my neighbors may not like me for uh, stating this but I believe that there's a, a real crisis um, the dam took 40 years to overflow and it's taken 40 years to start to run dry uh, 11 in AD 1100 all the people in the southwest the in indigenous people left because of a drought. Uh, Lake Tahoe was at least 200 feet lower than it is now. So this, this drought is not something that might go away and dealing with band-aids when you have cancer isn't a good policy. Uh, I believe that the path to the longest time that Las Vegas can go without draconian measures can only be achieved by stopping putting plumbing to new buildings because water users use water. New lots use water. So that's all I have to say, and I thank you for your patience, and I hope it beat the two-minute lining. You sure did by a good 12 seconds, and thank you. We are going to move to the You're phones. <laughs> thank you very much. We will take more testimony in Las Vegas. However, we are going to move to the phones right now because they've been waiting a little while as well. So BPS, do we have anyone on the phone for AB 220 who'd like to testify in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 220, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Alita Benson, Executive Director of the Nevada Republican Party, testifying in opposition to AB 220 on behalf of the Nevada Republican Party. What a deal. California uses all the water, but Nevada gets all the restrictions. Nevada leads the country in water recycling and con con conservation, but you never know it by reading this bill. At its heart, AB 220 is an attack on private property rights that ignores the reality of water shortages from the Colorado River. Nevada is not the problem when it comes to water. California is. At this very minute, California is bracing for record flooding from record Sierra Nevada snowpack with no plan to capture the water. They indeed get so much water from the Colorado River, they allow the excess to become the Salton Sea, an environmental hazard responsible for the widespread death of wildlife in the surrounding area. Again, why are Nevadans being punished for California's mismanagement of our shared resource? The Colorado River supplies 70% of San Diego's water. What are their water restrictions? No watering within 48 hours of rain and not overfilling swimming pools. We are not sharing the burden equally, but Nevada seems to have more than its fair share of punishment. We support the amendment submitted by Senator Wynn, which would improve the bill by making the state cover the switch to septic tanks. However, Section 29 of AB 220 allows an arbitrary restriction of water to single-family residences that targets homes in mature neighborhoods. Is the government having unchecked power over life, liberty, property, and water truly a good goal of government? The government is supposed to protect individual rights, including property rights, not try and strip them away. Nevada consumers pay for water. Our top 10 highest residential water users use more water in a month than the average household uses in a year. Perhaps they should start by reducing their water usage. Instead, Southern Nevada Water Authority slipped through rate increases targeting the middle class in the dead of night. The proposed changes to Section 29 should be removed entirely. Southern Nevadans are very aware that we live in a desert, and that's why we lead the country in conservation. We follow our watering schedules. Most neighborhoods do all they can to combat the dreaded heat island effect we see in locales like Phoenix that have targeted trees as the victim of water restrictions. But this bill will target mature neighborhoods and fixed income families. Ma'am, thank you so much. You're well over your two minutes. Sense. And we thank would you. encourage you to share your testimony thank with you. the committee secretary. So we have it. And we thank you very much for your time. Um, BPS, do we have more callers? B-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. I don't support this bill. I think it's too restrictive. First of all, when it comes to water conservation, I haven't heard any bills targeting casinos. Or what about those wasteful common areas that are basically fixed by HOAs? There's been a lot of reports that I've seen that the Colorado River, which is the main source of water for Clark County, has been overflowing. It's been drained in parts of Mexico because they do actually receive some of the water. Why aren't we encouraging California, which uses a larger share of the Colorado River, engage in desalination? They already have some desalination, and they're certainly doing a pretty good job in Israel and Saudi Arabia. What about all the waste that California is doing? Because they've been doing that for many, many years. Not to mention, a lot of the water is being used for agriculture. What is the alternative? We already have some indoor vertical farms here in Las Vegas. We need to encourage this entire region of the country to engage in vertical farms, which will substantially reduce water consumption. Absolutely. There's a lot of empty pools around the area. What's have been talked about that? I'm not talking about private pools. I'm talking about pools that are done by HOAs and other commercial facilities. So I urge you all not to support this bill. I will ditto the previous and future callers. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. I believe we have one more caller on the phone in opposition of AB 220. BPS? Good afternoon, Chair Pazina, committee members, Joseph DeMonte, D-E-M-O-N-T-E, -E, speaking in opposition. Uh, first, I would like to thank the uh, authors for their amendments, um, but the statutory guidance is still non-existent. Uh, I would like to address the remaining issues with this bill, specifically Section 29, which gives the Water Authority the ability to limit, which effectively, effectively means to cut off the water supply to a single-family residence, 
if that resident uses over a half acre foot of water per year. This section will affect approximately 115,000 homes and 400,000 residents and their home values, not a small subset as referenced by Assemblyman Watts and the Water Authority. The broad usage restriction is being created without the consideration statute to resident size or family size. This bill still allows a single person in a 1,200 square foot home to use as much water as a family of seven in a 3,500 square foot home without a defined waiver process or program. Issue two is that this bill will allow the water authority to hold the end user to a different legal standard on water usage than the authority is held to. The arbitrary half acre foot water limit is based on the total flow of water piped into the residence without consideration for the same return flow credits the authority is allowed based on their water rights contract. The authority boasts that 99% of water inside of a home is returned to Lake Mead and then that is claimed by the authority as a return flow credit and not counted against annual usage. The end user must be held to the same legal standard as the authority before any additional restrictions can be put on the end user. There was a historic increase to the Colorado River this year, and the Water Authority has over 117 billion gallons of water stored in reserve and supplements its water supply from 52 local wells at a rate of millions of gallons per day. There is time to fix this bill to help save our water supply in Southern Nevada. We all know that we face a crisis the bill is poorly written. It does not provide the same legal protections to the end user as the water authority is allowed. I thank you for your time, and I hope this bill will be paused and properly written to protect all of Southern Nevadans as well as our water supply. Thank you. All right, we are going to move back down to Vegas in opposition, and we do remind everyone to keep your comments within two minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joseph Gomez, and I was vehemently opposed to this bill from the onset. However, with the amendment that is just pre presented, I'm a little bit more uh, leaning towards um, approval of this. However, there are some unknowns here. On uh, the uh, uh, handout that we received of the um, submitted by Rochelle, uh, Senator Rochelle, item number four, two, it says the fee must not, or the, the fee, the fee that we're going to pay. Uh, to take advantage of the voluntary um, financial assistance. It says the fee must not exceed the annual sewer rate of the largest community sewer disposal system in the county. What is that? Who is the largest? How much is that going to be? Secondly, and I'll cut it short, what entity will run the financial assistance program? That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next present our next um, gentleman in testimony. Hello, my name is Mike O'Rourke. O Posh V R O U R K E. I'm not a don't have anything to do with what you people do there. I just don't understand why we're talking about sewers and shutting people's water off at the same time. We're trying to reclaim water. I appreciate that. And then we're talking about us using water. Two totally separate items in one bill. Uh, I live on a half acre piece of property. 20 years ago, I got rid of my grass in the front yard, kept it in the back. Have done a lot since then. I'm down to 10% grass and I'm still paying a ton, but I like my place. And, you're, and uh, I just don't appreciate the fact that one size fits everybody. I keep trying to work it out, but I just talked to a gentleman in the back here who said he's got a half acre of property and he has nothing but zero scape and he's already into paying all the extras that you have to pay because the water district runs amok. And I don't think I would give the water district ultimate authority over turning our water on and off either. I don't care if they're elected officials or not. Thank you. Next speaker, please. For the record, Tara Anderson, T-E-R-A-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. Um, I can't imagine any reasonable person would be interested in squelling or inefficiently using any natural resource. However, to generally abdicate authority and centralize it to the Southern Nevada Water Authority in one bill, while in this very same bill, providing carte blanche subjective authority to provide waivers and not provide qualifiable or quantifiable metrics by which those waivers would be 
allocated is um, incongruent at best. I appreciate the urgency of the issue and wanting us to address our uh, limited natural resources. However, doing something out of urgency that is fraught with all sorts of other unintended consequences, I think um, is, is ill-advised at this point. I'd encourage this body to reconsider uh, the details of the opportunity that this bill presents, um, both the formulaic approach of the water allocation share and also um, put some reasonable constraints should the Southern Nevada Water Authority be the governing body for this decision, um, emergency decision-making authority moving forward, so be it. But uh, the broad generalization, I think, very reasonably puts people um, uh, with grave concern uh, due to the just tremendous ambiguity. So thank you for your consideration, and I hope you'll obey this for future consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker. Our next speaker. My name is Summer Golia, G O L I A for the record. And um, I did owe everything that was said. And I also asked that um, if well owners are required to convert in the future, that it's 100% um, funded as well. And also that the Southern Nevada Health District just approved um, the use of an irrigation well in District 10 and 11 in, in Southern Nevada to uh, help with their mature landscaping to water their their lot sizes. So I think more of that should be allowed. And also that Southern Nevada Water Authority, City of Las Vegas, all the governing bodies down here are allowed to drill and put um, pumping stations in that go down really, really deep. And if they're allowed to use a drill rig on their property, then the homeowner should be also extended that same courtesy. So the hypocrisy is, the hypocrisy is eliminated. And what's fair for government and what's fair for homeowners is the same thing. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. BPS, did anyone come back to the phones in opposition? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right, seeing no one else in Las Vegas, right now we are going to move to neutral. So we're closing down testimony in opposition of AB 220 and moving into neutral. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Pazina, Bradley, Mayor of our Gentle Partners, for the record, representing the Southern Nevada, Nevada Health District. Um, I really do want to thank the Water Authority for engaging us early and quite often. Cannot emphasize that enough in this process as we've created this. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be happy to do our part um, as it relates to addressing our water challenges. We did just want to reemphasize for the record that the legislative intent of this is to only be using uh, external funds and funds from the voluntary fee that are earmarked uh, for this program as opposed to any health district uh, general funds or funds from other sources for the health district uh, because that is important and of course not articulated in the bill. I think uh, I I'm able to answer a few questions. One, uh, your question. I know to the gentleman in the audience there, the the dollar amount that I'm aware of uh, that is the maximum uh, yearly fee of the largest municipal water system in the country is $250. And I would also say in answer to uh, your question, Chair, that we don't actually know how many, the health district doesn't actually know how many septics are failing. Um, when they do fail, there are provisions in existing regulations, as, as Andy mentioned, that require uh, conversion if they're within 400 feet of the water line um that we're aware of one that's happened in the last a couple of years but they are not regularly inspected um for that reason and then i think that was the extent of your question correct it was thank you and we're going to limit to just the one question from senator gokachia right now because we are moving later into the evening and i want uh, to get everyone home for dinner with their family i, I really apologize but the 250 voluntary 250 dollar volunteer voluntary fee you're going to collect do you really think there's going to be a lot of people participate in that well the fee the fee would have to be set when the program is set up by the board of health so it just the bill really saying we can't set a fee mac you know past that amount and so i don't actually know what fee the board will set up and of course there'll be a public process for that as well but there will be a set fee within that 250 dollars yeah there yeah there, i mean if when the program the voluntary program is set up there would there would have to be a voluntary fee uh, assessed with it and of course then as external money comes into the account 
that the water authority has access to now and the voluntary fee is paid that would be the money that generally builds up over time and of course as opposed to the previous version of this bill will just take longer to do conversions uh, from the 5,000 roughly that would be eligible. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. <clears throat> Good evening, Chairwoman Pazina and members of the committee. I'm Rick Perdomo, Deputy Administrator for the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, or NDEP, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide neutral testimony on AB 220. Uh, this bill covers a lot of items, but I'm here this evening to testify solely on sections 3 through 4.5 of the first reprint and sections 2 and 4.5 in the proposed amendments posted to Nellis for uh, by the Southern Nevada Water, Water Authority. Um, while in the assembly and with respect to these sections, SNWA worked with NDEP to develop language to better define the roles and responsibilities of a local governing body when an owner operator of a privately owned uh, water system defaults on their responsibilities. Uh, the proposed amendments provide further clarity on the definition of a local governing body and issues involving excess surety funds. NDEP does not have concerns with the text of these sections in the reprint, uh, in reprint one, SNWA's written proposed amendments or SNWA's verbal amendment uh, provided at this hearing. Um, if there's any questions about our position, I'd be happy to take them. Okay, thank you so much. We'll move to our state engineer. Good evening, Chair Pazina, members of the committee of the committee, Adam Sullivan, state engineer, testifying neutral on AB 220. And there's, there's two points that I want to make comments uh, with regard to parts of this bill that directly intersect with the Division of Water Resources. Um, both were touched on by Mr. Belanger, uh, the first being section 24.5. Uh, this, this wasn't described much previously, but this would add a, uh, first of all, I really appreciate working with SNWA to to recognize the importance of this and including it in the bill. What this would do is add an exemption to the requirement to hold a water right for emergency situations to extinguish fires by a, by a uh, fire department or a, uh, a volunteer fire department or a public agency. Uh, and there are some, have been some situations where a small fire department holds a water right to, to put out fires and they can't prove up beneficial use until there's an emergency fire. So there's the case if they miss an extension of time, they lose that water right. Um, or if they do prove up and don't regularly use it, then they're subject to forfeiture. So it, the intent here is to add an exemption that would prevent these timelines from getting in the way of emergency fire suppression. Um, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't exempt a fire department from a water requirement for other daily uses. Now, the second part is section 26, and this is the portion that concerns um, uh, these temporary water right permits. And in this case, we're, we're specifically talking about temporaries that are also called revocables. And it only applies to the certain category of temporaries in Las Vegas Basin. Uh, for the most part, I concur with how Mr. Belanger characterized um, revocables. I can't exactly confirm the number of numbers of wells that that he was asked about. Uh, I think it sounds reasonable, but what I can add is that the total amount of water rights appropriated under revocable permits is 6,600 approximately, and the recent pumpage by revocable rights is about 4,500 acre feet annually. Um, the other point is that there are certain circumstances still where we where we issue uh, s small amounts of water under a revocable permit. Um, and it, Mr. Belanger mentioned that we, we finished that in 1992. Since 1992, we've had restrictions to allow only very small amount, uh, amounts of water issued under revocables. It, so this bill gives the state engineer the authority to revoke temporary permits uh, when municipal water is within 1,250 feet. Our office will not 
change any of the rules surrounding temporary permits until we've provided adequate time for public input and recommendations from affected parties because it does affect a lot of people, changes the rules, and um, we want to do what we can so people understand um, how that would be implemented. The bill also requires the state engineer to deny applications to appropriate groundwater or prohibit drilling of wells for domestic use in areas served by a public entity or, or where water can be furnished by a public entity. Uh, we intend to apply the 1250 foot re requirement from, from subsection three as the, as the primary factor for determining whether there is a public entity that is presently engaged in furnishing water and whether that water can be furnished. Um, it, it, however, there might, there might be other factors besides just that, that radius um, so in determining whether water can be provided, um, such as the cost or the engineering feasibility. And so it might take some time for, office, for our office to consider how we regulate temporary permits in the Las Vegas Basin, and we want to assure temporary permit holders that our office will be thoughtful and <coughs> deliberate in implementation of Section 26. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for those that haven't been to our hearings before, the reason we'll give those in neutral a little more leeway on the two minutes is because they're testifying on behalf of the state in regards to implementation. So it's important that we share that um, with the committee so we understand when voting on a bill how implementation actually works. Um, I believe we have someone in Vegas right now who'd like to testify in neutral on AB 220 and we'll invite her to speak. Thank you. I can actually say good evening, Chairwoman and Council Members. I am Bridget Salvi. It's spelled B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E-S-O-L-V-I-E. And I am speaking as a representative of several property owners in the Las Vegas, Lone Mountain, La Madre Hills area, as well as a private domestic well owner, a property owner. Um, I was very much in opposition of this bill. I can now say after working with Andy Bellinger extensively over teams and other phone calls that I would say I am in neutral. I greatly appreciate the efforts and modifications and amendments by our senators and representatives across the board to take out the mandate and create this as a voluntary program. It better reflects the inception idea three and a half years ago as a pilot program, strictly being voluntary. It allows both SNWA and the health district to truly get the pulse of interest and the cost that's required to pull off this kind of conversion process for septic owners. I would like to ask for some clarification regarding that domestic well owners such as myself, one well, one property, can still opt in if we so choose to the conversion program that this isn't solely focused on municipal water owners and septic people. Um, I would also further like to clarify or seek clarification that this amendment puts a cap on the bill at $250 annually, yet I'm hearing side rumors that the possibility will be only about $100 annual. So I'd like to see some better clarification as to what that fee would actually be in a number and not just what the outside cap would be. Um, uh, Senator Hansen commented that we can't conserve our way out of this issue. Uh, I completely and wholly agree. We've had other people from uh, university and different areas that have said, we, as hard as we may try, we can't fully conserve our way out of this problem. There are other dynamic issues that play into this whole picture. Thank you With so much. You're well over two minutes, add, so I'm going to have you finish your thought for us and definitely turn in your testimony because we want to have it. Thank you. One final thought is with regards to the waiver that has been pro provided in Senator Wynn's uh, amendment, I would like to see language to include the waiver for horses, livestock, cattle, llamas, goats. There's nothing there for the private owner that has these animals that may be served on municipal water because they consume an awful lot of water. They should be able to be allowed to seek a waiver as well from the half acre foot should that be implemented. Thank you very much. 
All right. Thank you so much. Is there anyone so else much. in Las Vegas testifying in neutral? And while we wait on that, BPS, is there anyone on the phones in neutral? Hello. Um, good evening. My name is Diane Henry, D-I-A-N-E. H E N R Y, and I have been very opposed to this bill. However, I do support Senator Wynn's amendment, and um, I appreciate all the hard work by her and the committee on this. But I'm neutral based mainly on needing clarification on Section 29 and the waivers. Um, while I appreciate Senator Scheibel's comment that in case of federal water emergency, if water restrictions are needed, who knows if it would end, even end up being a half-acre foot restriction after it goes through the public process. But I would propose that if the bill says it will be a half-acre restriction, then that is what is likely to happen. And um, I also am not seeing... I did not hear anything about water restrictions also being based on lot size. Um, the average Las Vegas lot is about 5,000 square foot or less, and they use an average of 130,000 gallons per year of water. Um, septic properties of a half acre or larger are 20,000 square foot minimum, and SNWA says we use an average of 286,000 gallons. So to hold us to a half acre, which is 163,000, even though it's a temporary water restriction, by the time the river recovers and we're allowed to use water again, the landscaping throughout my entire neighborhood would be dead. And that says a lot about quality of life and our home values if that were to happen. So I would propose that larger lots with mature trees especially need to be provided a, a cushion there. Um, and I was also very glad to hear that landscape and hardscape costs will be recovered, but I'm worried that um, road repair will only be covered in the public right-of-way um, this could leave a lot of... Ma'am, you're actually um, well, well over private. two minutes. So we're going to have you submit your additional comments um, to the committee secretary because we would really love to review them. If you have a quick five-second way of ending, though, we'd love to have you complete your thought. Um, private cul-de-sacs are not included, and repaving could cost thousands of dollars per home. So I would, I would ask that all road maintenance be done. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I believe that was our last caller. Is that correct, BPS? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right. Well, I'm going to close testimony on neutral and thank everyone in Las Vegas who came out on a busy day to be part of this hearing. We really appreciate your engagement in the legislative process. And with that, we'll invite, I don't see Assemblyman Watts, but I do see SNWA and Senator Wynn. If any of you would like to give any closing thoughts or um, answer any questions that came up during the hearing. Um, Chair Pazina, Andy Belanger with the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Um, in response to a couple of the questions that we heard, I think, I think, um, Mr. Mayor gave the answer on the annual fee, the $250, which is what the Clark County Water Reclamation District charges. Um, so I wanted to make sure that was clear on the record. There was also a question about annexation that we heard. Really quickly on that fee, there was also the question, is it a one-time fee or an annual fee? Yeah, it's a, sorry, it's an annual fee. Thank you. That, uh, that the health district could impose, and it would be voluntary. Uh, the question was raised about annexation. I, I can give you both a personal example and, um, and a... Uh, historic example, the city of, of Las Vegas and Clark County have reached an agreement that requiring properties or properties that wish to get onto sewer does not trigger annexation in the Northwest. So that was a uh, an agreement that was reached, uh, I believe in 2017 or 2019, uh, but it addresses that question of annexation. I will tell you, I live within a county island and I get my sewer service from the city of Las Vegas sewer and we're under no threat of annexation. So. Uh, that was a question that was raised. I want to make sure that was clear on the record. 
I just wanted to add that um, to the concern about the half acre foot that by and large our properties that are using more than a half acre foot of water are using on an irrigation. Um, it is almost always turf irrigation. Turf on average uses 73 gallons a square foot. Even lush mature trees are putting us in the landscape use of less than 20 gallons per square foot. Um, that's because you don't have the wind loss, you don't have the evaporative loss. I recently helped review a property that was a two acre horse property that has 2000 square feet of turf. Because of our metering data, we can isolate their irrigation. This is a property that was getting our excessive use surcharge to the tune. Their largest one was 9,000 gallons in one month under the excessive use surcharge. From their irrigation signal, we can isolate that they are using over 600,000 gallons of water on their 2,000 square feet of turf. Um, that is something that people just don't realize is the time that they water their turf is what's driving this. Uh, I know the excessive use surcharge is not the half acre foot issue, but there's a lot of parallels here. When we implemented the excessive use surcharge, 55% of our customers never got it a second time. That's not time to change out your landscaping. That's not time to do a turf conversion. That's somebody that was over watering that has fixed that. That is what this is really targeting. Uh, care homes, other things, we do not see them hitting that half acre threshold um, unless they have excessive landscaping use. And we also have the ability for certain types of businesses under certain conditions to have a commercial meter, not a residential meter. So they would not be subject to this limitation as a residence if it is truly a business that is operating in a single family home. I missed. That's good. Okay, well we thank you so much. And with that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 220 and move to our final order of business which is public comment. Thank you so much, Mr. Belanger and Ms. Pellegrino. Um, as a reminder, public comment cannot have anything to do with the bills that were discussed during the hearing today. Seeing no one rushing to the front in Carson City and no one racing to the front to make public comment in Las Vegas, I will again thank those in Las Vegas today for caring enough about our process to come in person. BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. If you would like to participate in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. We'll see everyone back here Thursday at 3.30 p.m. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.